Thank you, councillors. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make here today. Amen. Amen. We acknowledge this country and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as traditional custodians, their language, songs and dance. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. May we continue to peacefully walk together in respect and in caring for this country and one another. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Are there any apologies? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Mr Landers. Chair, I advise that Councillor Marks will be absent today and I move that she be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that Councillor Marks be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Confirmation of minutes, Chair. please. Oh, sorry. Councillor yeah, uh, I wish Cassidy. to advise Councillor Griffiths will be absent, so move that he be granted a leave My apologies, of I absence. didn't see you standing. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Cassidy and seconded by Councillor Cook that Councillor Griffiths be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. All in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,680th meeting held on Tuesday, 24th of May 2022, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the minutes of the 4,680th meeting the Council held on 24 May 2022 be received taken as read and confirmed. All in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we have a uh, public, or have public participants this morning, this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to call on Dr Marion Hanson and Ms Vicky Henry, who are coming into the chamber now to address us on Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Thank you. Billy, I've shown you to your chairs. I think we we'll set you up with a mic each. So. Thank you. Dr Hanson, um, Ms Henry, you have five minutes to commence once the mics are on and you're ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Schrinner, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today about our request the Council to sign the City's Appeal. My name is Marianne, of course. I'm the co-chair of ICANN, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017, by the way. And I'm also represented here today, uh, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom with my colleague, Vicky Henry. I have met some of you already, and I hope to meet more of you in due course in order to provide any further context you might need. I've also left some leaflets which will provide more information for you. Unfortunately, we have a pressing problem in our world. There are still over 13,000 nuclear weapons in existence. And many of these are hundreds of times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. We are closer now than we have ever been to a nuclear catastrophe. Numerous close calls and accidents have occurred where these weapons are very nearly being used. So you may well ask, well, what does this have to do with council, with local government? The problem is these weapons are targeted at cities like Brisbane, and it is local councils which will have to address issues like burial, sanitation, uh, hygiene, local sewerage, infrastructure, etc., in the unthinkable event of a nuclear strike or accident. Now, because of these responsibilities, councillors around the world have signed the city's appeal, 
which calls on all nine nuclear weapon states to eliminate their nuclear weapons, not unilaterally, but as part of a, a mutual process in a phased, verified, and fully monitored way. Over 400 cities worldwide, including New York, Paris, London, Berlin, um, and 39 LGAs across Australia, Sydney, Brisbane, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, <laughs> soon to be Brisbane, we hope, have signed up to the city's appeal. They have recognised that, as with other weapons of mass destruction, like chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons can also be eliminated. Now, we very much appreciate the fact that Council has an existing anti-nuclear policy dating back to the early 80s. But there are three reasons why we believe this policy should be updated. First of all, the threat of nuclear war has actually grown since the 1980s. And we only need to look at the, the war in Europe to understand the dangers here. Secondly, we now have much better scientific modelling than we had in the 1980s about the climate and social impacts of a nuclear strike, and it shows a pretty grim picture of devastation. Even a small nuclear war would result in millions of deaths and create a nuclear winter affecting the whole world, where entire cities and ecosystems would be destroyed. And third, we have a brand new United Nations treaty which calls for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Let me stress that this is not a political or a partisan issue. It is a humanitarian issue. In Australia, thousands of healthcare workers, the Australian Medical Association, Rotarians, religious organisations, the Red Cross, and as I say, hundreds of parliamentarians from all the major political parties have signed up to help eliminate these weapons of mass destruction. So it is a cross-party issue. Um, and even conservative leaders, like Henry Kissinger in the United States, for example, have argued that for the sake of humanity, we must eliminate these weapons. And by the way, signing the city's appeal and the new UN treaty does not mean that we have to abandon the ANZUS alliance. Many US allies have already signed the treaty. We can remain within the ANZUS alliance, if you wish, on a conventional weapons basis. So in sum, Brisbane Council can demonstrate its commitment to protect the people of Brisbane by joining cities around the world which have already signed the city's appeal. Eliminating nuclear weapons helps us to build a better world to focus on things like that matter, like our families, our communities, our environment. And we saw, of course, in the local elect the recent election, that these things matter very much to people. Dr. Henry, I'm sorry. Thank your, you. Your time has expired. Thank, thank you, you very for much for your council. attention. Um, and there will be a response, Councillor Davis. Oh, well, thank you, um, um, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, Dr. Hanson and um, Ms. Henry. Uh, my name is Councillor Tracy Davis, and I'm the Civic Cabinet Chair for the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee here in Council. Uh, and thank you very much for coming in today and addressing us uh, about the work um, of your organisation. And can I acknowledge uh, that it is the longest or the oldest women's peace organisation um, that I understand was established uh, in 1915. And thank you very much uh, for sharing your insights uh, into the impacts of nuclear uh, weaponry. Uh, we do recognise that uh, concerted efforts are needed at all levels of government uh, on the issue of nuclear weapons. And while the federal government has responsibility for, fine, uh, for signing the UN's treaty, uh, as you mentioned, there are many cities and organisations uh, that have, uh, and campaigns that have come on board around the world to encourage world leaders to sign up. Uh, much like the organisation, of course, that you're representing here today. And while Council has previously backed our internal policy, which outlines Brisbane being a nuclear-free zone uh, as an example of, our, um, of the matter, uh, we understand the intent behind your campaign. Uh, that's why 
I'm very pleased today uh, to advise that Brisbane City Council will join uh, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and endorse the City's appeal uh, that you have presented to us. Uh, between Council's internal policy and your City's appeal, we trust that these acts of symbolism will help other local governments across the country to support in your campaign. So thank you very much for coming in today and speaking with us. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Thank you. Thanks for coming in today. Appreciate it. Dr Hanson and Ms. Hen and Ms Henry, thank you. Mics are off. Councillors, question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Civic Cabinet Chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Landers. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, at the last election you promised Ashgrove residents that the Gresham Street Bridge would be completely replaced and rebuilt. Could you please update the Chamber on the current status of this project, including how its delivery will service Ashgrove residents for decades to come? Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, through you, thank you to Councillor Landis for the question. Uh, it was good to be out there this morning with Councillor Toomey uh, at the Gresham Street Bridge. Uh, this is an interesting one because what we saw with this project is the replacement of one of Brisbane's last remaining wooden road bridges uh, with a better, more resilient, uh, longer lasting and more pedestrian friendly structure. Now, the interesting thing about this is not just that it was replacing one of the older wooden bridges, but it illustrates that our business as usual is building things in a more resilient way. Now, this project started well before the recent floods. And in fact, I think it was in April last year uh, that we were out there uh, kicking off this project. Uh, today, or yesterday, in fact, we saw uh, the first use of the new bridge. There's still a little bit of work to be done out there to finalise the project, but the bridge is being used and the temporary bridge that was put in uh, to facilitate the construction is now being dismantled. The new bridge provides the only access in and out of St John's Wood. So there is no other way in and out for around the 300 uh, residents that live in that precinct. And what they were facing with the old wooden bridge is uh, every couple of years the bridge would be flooded and they would be trapped, either trapped inside the area or trapped out of the area, depending uh, on whether they were at home or not at the time. So this new bridge builds uh, the flood resilience of the area, not just the flood resilience of the infrastructure, but the flood resilience of that entire community. Uh, it's been a, a project that lifts the level of the bridge up uh, over a metre higher than the previous bridge, builds it in a much stronger and more flood resilient manner, but also uh, provides much better accessibility for pedestrians, cyclists, and also buses as well. With the old bridge, buses could not turn left uh, off, um, off the major thoroughfare there into that precinct, whereas now there is public transport access in all directions. So it's just one of many projects that we're doing across the city, but it just does illustrate, Mr Chair, that whatever we do these days, we're always bearing in mind uh, resilience in our infrastructure uh, and also building things stronger uh, and building things with the long term in mind. Uh, this project was supported uh, by the previous federal government with um, a, a contribution. Uh, Council did put in the lion's share of the funding but uh, we certainly welcome that uh, federal support for this project. I want to thank the local councillor Steve Toomey who um, moonlights as the project manager. Um, he uh, has been out there uh, at all uh, hours of the day and sometimes the night, um, keeping an eye on progress. Our council's uh, project manager has done a great job, but um, Steve is just making sure that on behalf of residents, everything uh, has been going well. And so congratulations to the project team. Congratulations to Councillor Toomey uh, for championing this project. Uh, and as I said, this is one example of many where we're building infrastructure with an eye to the future, building it to be not only more resilient infrastructure, but helping our community become more resilient as well. Uh, and so I commend this project and it's great to see that milestone reached uh, yesterday where we saw the first use of the very new bridge. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Well, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, over the last financial year, 
you allocated just $21.8 million to construct drainage infrastructure across 190 suburbs in Brisbane. Now, in comparison, you're spending $1.7 billion uh, on your overseas Metro Bendy bus project. So that's 78 times the suburban drainage budget on a single inner city busway extension. So, Lord Mayor, yes or no, do you think residents are getting value for money under your LNP administration? Thank you, Lord Mayor. You better believe it. You better believe it, because not only are we building the major infrastructure our city needs as it grows, we're also investing in the suburbs in things like drainage, in footpaths, in all of those suburban projects. And in fact, over 80 per cent of all our investment is in the suburbs. Uh, what we're seeing here, though, Mr Chair, is a very uh, cynical attempt uh, to uh, confect confect a political campaign in the lead up to the budget, uh, which is very reactionary, because I didn't hear Councillor Cassidy talking about drainage last year. Did anyone? I, I don't remember him running a campaign on drainage last Councillor year. Cassidy. When we increased the budget Councillor by 10 per cent last year, I didn't hear him saying anything about it then, or I don't remember. Does anyone else? No, I don't think so. Uh, he's, he's a newfound convert into drainage in recent times. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, but this is what happens when you've got no agenda as a Labor Party leader. You, you just scratch around in the dirt for issues that, that literally uh, you didn't care about before, you didn't care about before, and suddenly, and suddenly you're a convert to drainage. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't speaking up when we increased the budget by 10 per cent last year. Uh, and I can say, Councillor Cassidy, I can say, Councillor Cassidy, you are going to be very pleased when the next budget comes out. In fact, in fact I look forward uh, to his celebration when the next budget comes out. Does anyone predict whether that will happen or he'll complain? I don't know. I don't know. I, mate, some, some would say that no matter what we do in the budget, he'll complain. But that's a very cynical view. I, look, I think he'll be very happy. I think he will be very happy uh, because we will continue to invest in the suburbs. We will continue to invest in uh, much needed infrastructure right across the city. And whether it's uh, drainage, whether it's the flood recovery work that needs to be done, uh, whether it is footpaths and road maintenance, uh, whether it is all of those uh, important things that need to be done as we recover as a city, we will be focusing on that absolutely. Drainage will be one part of that, uh, but as I've said previously, that is not the silver bullet. Uh, there are so many other things that can contribute to more a flood a more flood resilient city uh, other than drainage, uh, and uh, it is important that we as civic leaders do not uh, sell snake oil to people by, by making them think that you know, some extra funding for drainage will solve every problem. It, it won't. It won't. It needs to be a multi-pronged response. And that is exactly what we are doing and exactly what we will continue to do. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, the Sri Lanka Council's award-winning Brisbane Metro project continues to reach new milestones. With the recent arrival of the Metro pilot vehicle in Brisbane, could you please update the Chamber on the features of this vehicle, including an update on the wider Metro project? Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thanks to Councillor Huang for the question. It's great to have Councillor Huang back, and he has been a tremendous supporter of Brisbane Metro over a very, very long time. Chair, I'll, uh, I'll continue. Uh, Chair, as part of the Brisbane Metro, residents in our city uh, enough, will be the first enough, in, ex in Australia to experience one of the most advanced electric vehicles in the world when services begin in 2024. In 2019, we started one of Brisbane Metro's most important components, designing and delivering a vehicle that is truly world-class for our Strunk. customers. The end result is what we have here today, the Hess Light Tram 25, a vehicle with the <coughs> highest standards of passenger access, comfort, safety and zero tailpipe emissions. This vehicle is in itself an Australian first. It's capable of quietly and efficiently and cleanly moving large numbers of people in a type of comfort and accessibility that has not been seen before in our country. Across three passenger compartments, the Metro can hold 150 people or 170 in event mode. There are 64 seats, 10 of which are priority seating, 
15, as well as three large mobility bays complete with luggage storage. The low floor design and panoramic windows mean the vehicle feels light and spacious with powerful air conditioning that will keep us cool even in Brisbane's humid summers, although you may not feel it today, Chair. The next stop announcements and passenger information screens will make sure you always know when your stop is coming up and Wi-Fi and USB charging hubs will keep you connected while you travel. Every compartment has audio and hearing loops and there is an automated accessibility ramp at the first passenger door. And I know the Labor Party love to laugh about the accessibility features on this vehicle, Chair, but the reality is for those who live with a disability, these are really important features that will make a difference in their ability to access public transport around our city. And we do not have uh, these type of features on the rest of our fleet at present. Our drivers also get an upgrade, Chair, a separated driver cabin with next generation driver assistive technologies to make sure our drivers can focus on the task at hand, getting our passengers from A to B. Mr Chair, these features have set the new standard for passenger safety, comfort and accessibility in Australia, uh, but it's not just pretty inside, it's also powerful. There are two fully electric 190 kilowatt traction motors generating 2,500 nanometres of torque, delivering better performance than an equivalent diesel engine with just a fraction of the noise. In fact, Chair, uh, you will know as we had a conversation outside of Metro that was running the other day with all of its air conditioning turned on. The top of the vehicle is fitted with a charging arm, what we call a pantograph, which allows for the flash charge of the vehicle in under six minutes at four key locations across the network. At the end of a shift, the metros will be slow charged uh, at the depot to maximise the lifespan of the battery and optimise energy consumption. The vehicle has been in testing since it arrived last month and we're putting it through its paces to ensure it meets all of our requirements before we then place the order for the rest of the fleet. As I mentioned, our metros are based on a proven product, the Hess Light Tram 25, but we want to make sure that it performs here in Brisbane conditions. There are no conditions more trying for a public transport vehicle than conditions here in Brisbane. This vehicle has to pass just over 750 tests made up of over 1,300 individual technical requirements. Over half those tests were passed before the pilot vehicle even arrived in Brisbane, but we'll be evaluating this vehicle's manoeuvrability, functionality, accessibility, its energy consumption and its onboard systems as we go. On the busway, we want to test the range of the vehicle's charge, the speed and compatibility with our station platforms. It will also be visiting the RACQ's mobility centre at Mount Cotton for performance and evaluation testing, and we'll be going up Mount Cutha for gradient testing, otherwise known as the hill climb. Uh, residents may get a glimpse of the vehicle in testing mode when it travels on the Gateway motorway, the Pacific motorway, the southeast and northern busways, as well as some local roads. Mr Chair, another part of what makes Brisbane Metro such an exciting project is the way our vehicles will inter integrate into the city's existing infrastructure. Thanks to the vehicle design, we've been able to deliver a fully electric, high capacity vehicle without the need to install costly and intrusive overhead wires or tracks. It's a system that has the, capaci the capacity of light rail with the flexibility of a bus. The flexibility and manoeuvrability not being tied to track infrastructure means it can be easily adapted to different transport routes, making it a lot easier to expand the metro uh, network into the future. It's one of the most cost-effective solutions for improving public transport and reaching our sustainability goals. Our busway network in Brisbane means that we can seamlessly deliver a turn up and go service from Eight Mile Plains in the south to Hurston in the north. Councillor Murphy, your time has expired. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, recently the Morton Bay Mayor took responsibility... I'll start again. Recently the Morton Bay Mayor took responsibility and informed his residents that rates will be going up in their upcoming council budget. He wanted to give residents as much time as possible to prepare their own finances. Despite repeated questions from reporters, residents and councillors, you have refused to do the same for the people of Brisbane. Lord Mayor, will you be increasing rates in the upcoming council budget, and if so, by how much? Thank you. Lord Mayor. Well, Mr Chair, Councillor Cook obviously comes to this place and doesn't listen one bit, because this question has been asked before and been answered, and I, I, look, I, I don't know what she does in these meetings, but it's certainly not listening to answers that are given, uh, because as I pointed out the last time this question was asked, the budget has not been completed yet, uh, and that process is ongoing. Uh, and 
uh, when it is completed, it will be released publicly in the ordinary way. Now, um, I'm sure Councillor Cook would love to assist me in preparing the budget, uh, but that is not the role that she has. Uh, and so uh, Councillor Cook will find out the same way that all councillors will find out once the budget is complete. Uh, but what I can say is uh, when Labor councillors criticise us for putting projects on pause so that we can focus on the flood recovery, what does that do? If we actually took their advice, it would mean more upward pressure on rates. If we continue to do projects that they have criticised us for pausing, that would put upward pressure on rates. Uh, but what I can promise, Mr Chair, to Councillor Cook is we will never raise rates as much as the Labor Party did when they were in uh, office in City Hall. We will never raise rates as much as they did when they ra raised rates by 6 per cent on four different occasions. Now, Councillor Cumming uh, mentions inflation. Uh, he, he interjected last week on inflation. Uh, we have seen the highest inflation uh, that we've seen in decades now across Australia. Uh, and we see the national inflation rate of 5.1. And I understand the Brisbane inflation rate is 6%. 6%. But I can, tell, I can tell all of you, we won't be raising rates by 6% like Labor did. Even if inflation is 6%, we won't be doing it. Uh, so please rest assured, rates will uh, be lower than the Brisbane inflation rate. Uh, and uh, you will find out in a couple of weeks' time what that outcome will be. Uh, but we will never raise rates by 6 per cent like Labor did repeatedly. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance and City Given Governance Committee, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham, with the dust of the federal election now settling, can you please update the Chamber on election commitments that were promised by the incoming government? Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, thanks to Councillor Atwood for the question. As the Lord Mayor said last week, the Shrina Council congratulates Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and his team on their election, and we look forward to continuing to have a positive relationship with the federal government. The local roads and community infrastructure program introduced by the former government was hugely successful with over $75 million in funding provided to 74 projects in Brisbane across three phases. These projects have supported our economic recovery during the pandemic, and they continue to support us as we recover from the floods. The coalition announced a two-year $500 million extension in the budget, which will take the total size of this program to $3 billion. We were pleased to receive confirmation during the campaign that Labor will also honour this commitment and allow for a further $250 million extension. Local government is the level of government which is closest to the people, so we appreciate this commitment from Canberra to working with councils right across Australia, but especially here in Queensland, to deliver projects which create better communities. We will ensure that Brisbane continues to get its fair share from the LRCI program, Mr Chair. Prior to the election, the former federal government also confirmed funding towards two flood-affected clubs. As Councillor Atwood, you would be aware, Ross Vasta secured $4 million for clubs at Carmichael Park in Tengalpa, and also in my ward, $900,000 was secured for East Football Club at Heath Park in East Brisbane. We trust that these commitments, which the federal government wrote to council to confirm prior to caretaker period, will be honoured by the Albanese government. There were a number of other commitments made right across Brisbane by Labor MPs and Labor candidates during the election campaign to support clubs on council land, including flood-affected clubs. We look forward to these projects being funded and rolled out in the coming years to support community clubs in suburbs across Brisbane. For example, $2 million was committed for Souths at Davies Park in West End to work with Council to plan the future for this valued green space. Councillor Cassidy would, I'm sure, welcome the $5 million commitment made to upgrade the Brighton foreshore. The Lord Mayor has committed to delivering consultation and the concept plan this term, and the funding from the federal government will ensure that upgrades can be delivered after that. 
In Sunnybank, $2 million was committed to accessibility upgrades for the Mains Road pedestrian overpass. At Tui Forest, $400,000 was committed to continue Council's investments in wildlife movement solutions across the city, with funding for a fauna crossing. As Shadow Environment Minister, Terry Butler developed an urban rivers and catchments policy. I'd like to think she was inspired by the work done by the Shrina Council in delivering the Oxley Creek and Norman Creek master plans, and in particular, the transformation that has occurred at Hanlon Park in Stones Corner. The $200 million program will see funding provided to community groups, local and state governments to restore local waterways and habitats and create valuable recreational space in the process. There were funding commitments made across Brisbane for a number of councils supported creek catchment groups. There was also $2.5 million commitment to a project to renaturalise Downfall Creek. On major transport projects, we look forward to continuing work with the federal government on the delivery of the Brisbane Metro and also on our city deal projects. So, Mr Chair, there are a number of projects that have been committed to in Brisbane, and we look forward to continuing our strong relations with the federal government, because we know that when different levels of government work together, we can achieve much for the community, and that is the approach of the Shrina Council. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Sri. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Mayor. Following on from that last discussion about rate rises, I wonder if the Mayor could express an opinion or comment on the um, the value of potentially increasing rates for other categories of properties, such as commercial properties or industrial properties, so that we don't have to increase rates for owner-occupier homes by as much or at all? Do you think there is a good argument for increasing rates on those other investment style of properties so that rates for residents can be kept lower? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question through you, Mr Chair. To Councillor Shree, oh, look, that is something that has uh, happened from time to time. Uh, we know that uh, our residential rates in Brisbane are actually amongst the lowest in South East Queensland already, and the reason is because we have this economic hub right here. The CBD, those, those booming inner city areas uh, which are commercial, and they're contributing to help keep residential rates down. So that is already the case at the moment. Uh, if you go to the surrounding council areas and you ask for their average residential rate bill, you will find it is already significantly higher than the Brisbane rate bill. And so uh, the, this, this factor uh, that Councillor Shree refers to is a real one. And the fact that we are the economic and jobs hub of the South East Queensland region means that our rates for residents are lower. And so uh, that is something that you know, is, a, is a consideration in any budget, and you've pointed out something that is quite legitimate. And it's a good reminder that uh, you know, the, the economic activity and the boom that is happening here in Brisbane uh, does have benefits for residents out in the suburbs, because when ac economic activity does well in those inner city areas, it means that residents pay less than their comparative uh, council areas in, in other parts of Brisbane, uh, in, in other parts of South East Queensland, that is. And so, uh, yeah, it, it would be an interesting comparison to do, to have a look at those average rate bills in, in other surrounding SEQ councils, uh, because without, without... Maybe we should do that, Councillor Murphy. But um, you have raised a good point, Councillor Shree. Um, and, and thank you again for... You know, coming to this... Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Street. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just to the, the nub of the question, you've, you've talked around it, but will you actually consider raising rates for those other classes of properties to offset the, the cost of resident rates? Well, rates for those other categories are already significantly higher. Uh, the categories are, are bringing significant more revenue. The rating categories are significantly higher for other types of uses in the city. Uh, we have always consistently uh, tried to keep those residential rates as low as possible and, and the way that that happens is by capturing some of that economic activity that happens around the city uh, to help keep rates down for everyone else. Thank you, Thank you for Shree. the questions. Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. 
Councillor Howard, this week is National Reconciliation Week. Right across the country, communities are celebrating and remembering this week to learn about our shared stories, cultures and achievements. Could you please update the Chamber on how the Schrinner Council is celebrating National Reconciliation Week here in Brisbane? Thank you. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and through you I thank Councillor Hutton for her interest in how Council supports and enables the events across the city as they promote and acknowledge National Reconciliation Week. Every year, National Reconciliation Week runs from the 27th of May to the 3rd of June, both of which being significant milestones in the reconciliation journey. The date of the successful 1967 referendum and the 1992 High Court Mabo decision, respectively. In between these two significant dates, Nat National Reconciliation Week is a time for all Australians to learn about our shared histories, cultures and achievements and to explore how each of us can contribute to achieving reconciliation in Australia. Each year, the theme of every Reconciliation Week is different, with this year's theme being Be Brave, Make Change. This year's theme is a challenge to us all to be brave and tackle the unfinished business of reconciliation so we can continue to make change for all as we reflect on our past and strive for a better future for all Australians. This year, a number of activations have been scheduled not only throughout National Reconciliation Week but also for National Sorry Day, which takes place every year on the 26th of May. On Thursday last week, I accompanied the Lord Mayor to Council's ceremony to observe National Sorry Day in King George Square, followed by a candle lighting ceremony in recognition of the children, families and communities affected by the forced separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Across the city, Council's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander team also work with community organisations to support a number of ceremonies across Brisbane, giving residents to the, the opportunity to reflect upon and commemorate National Sorry Day. The Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge and Redcliffe Place sculptures were also lit red, black and yellow to commemorate National Sorry Day on the 26th of May. And again on the 29th of May, um, assets across the city were lit up in the colours of red, black, yellow, blue and green in recognition of National Reconciliation Week. At our libraries, Council has continued to deliver programs such as our first Five Forever Jar Jum Storytime programs and our Reading for Reconciliation program. Having first commenced in October 2021, our first Five Forever Jar Jum stories are held monthly at the Brackenridge, Brisbane Square, Sunnybank Hills and Wynnum Libraries. These sessions recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures as our first Australian cultures and work to build awareness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, perspectives, stories, authors and illustrators. Through our Reading Through Reconciliation program, we encourage our residents to improve their knowledge and understanding of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues and histories. The Reading Through Reconciliation group seeks to assist members of the community to start a reconciliation journey through reading and discussing selected texts in an informal and friendly setting. In addition, I'd like to take this opportunity to update the Chamber on this year's Indigenous Art Program, Outstanding, which will be displayed throughout Brisbane's Outdoor Art Gallery until the 7th of August. Outstanding is shining a spotlight on promising, emerging and early career First Nations artists through artworks, artist talks, open studios, workshops and guided talks taking place across the city. To learn more about the art and artists on display across Brisbane, we are encouraging residents to join one of the many walking tours taking place to learn about the art artworks on display across the city. Council's Indigenous Art Program has run annually since 2016 and has exhibited more than 80 First Nations artists and their unique stories and is a program that we are very proud to support. Council recognises that reconciliation must live in the hearts, minds and actions of all Australians as we move forward, creating a nation strengthened by respectful relationships between the wider Australian community and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. As part of this process, members of our Inclusive Communities team recently met with 40 residents, elders and custodians who provided comprehensive feedback to Council and our Re Reconciliation Action Plan. And I'm happy to update the Chamber here today to say that we have incorporated that valued feedback Council received as part of this process and our Reconciliation Action Plan has been provided to Reconciliation Australia for review and endorsement. 
It is through awareness, events and practices like these, including the continued work on our reconciliation plan, action plan, that we can walk together on this continued journey towards reconciliation. We have so much to be proud of as a city and as Australians, and our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage is something that the Schrinner Council will continue to celebrate, strengthen and support for years to come. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, just days before the federal election, you took out the trash, using the floods as an excuse to cut a number of suburban projects that uh, you once championed, including the Inogra Creek Sport and Recreation Precinct and the North Brisbane Bikeway. Before you announced this publicly, the former LNP member for Brisbane, Trevor Evans, was sending letters to residents claiming these projects being cut as a win, saying his influence over your LNP administration forced you to reconsider these projects. Lord Mayor, did you cut these projects to give your LNP mate a helping hand in the dying moments of his campaign? Lord Mayor. <clears throat> if uh, Councillor Cassidy thinks that a bikeway had anything to do with the federal election result, um, he's uh, barking up the wrong tree there. Um, I don't think uh, the North Brisbane bikeway had any influence whatsoever on the federal election result. Uh, it was uh, definitely other issues at play there. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you what did have an influence on uh, the bikeway, and that is the fact that we have to spend $50 million fixing existing bikeways before we can build new bikeways. Uh, and that's exactly what we'll be doing, because uh, making sure that that existing connectivity can be re-established is absolutely critical. Uh, and the $50 million investment uh, that's estimated at this point in time is a big one. Uh, it's a significant one, and it's one that we want to get on with. And so uh, that is right now our priority. Uh, but when it comes to bikeways, we have an absolutely proud record right across the city of investing in bikeways, investing in uh, shared infrastructure, um, separated infrastructure and a whole range of other facilities uh, that make our city more sustainable and easier to get around. And we will continue to do so in the future. And in fact, you will not find uh, another administration in the history of Brisbane City Council that has invested more in public and active transport than this one. And even with some temporary pauses on various projects, we'll still be investing more than anyone has ever done in the past. Now, there are some people who would like to make this about, oh, you support motorists and you don't support cyclists. I mean, that is just a rubbish argument. That is uh, an argument of uh, people who would prefer to divide than unite. Uh, and that is an argument of people who quite clearly hate motorists. I mean, that, that is not a productive way uh, to look at uh, a debate like this. Uh, we've been consistent the whole time investing in all the different modes of travel, uh, not just one, all of them. And uh, we know that there are some that would have us stop investing in roads altogether. And in fact, even uh, some councillors that think that if we uh, have a road that floods from time to time, it should be closed down. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that because uh, roads are an important way to get around the city, just as active travel uh, and pedestrian and cyclist facilities are, and uh, we will continue to invest right across the spectrum. Uh, we, um, unfortunately, unlike the Greens, I can, I can tell you we do not hate motorists. We don't hate cyclists. We don't hate pedestrians. We love everyone. Uh, we love everyone. The only uh, policy agenda that has hatred in it is the Greens agenda, uh, where they hate motorists with a passion, they want to punish motorists, uh, and, 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 and I can say... Uh, Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Thrones. Just wondering if the Mayor could take a question about his mobile phone ringtone. That's not an appropriate point of order. No, but, Lord Mayor, you heard the question. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that wasn't my ringtone. <laughs> um, uh, so we, we will continue to invest right across the different modes of travel because we believe that making sure people have options is the critical thing. And, um, you know, we know, we know, for example, that uh, all of those people uh, on the weekend that just got, had just gone past that voted Green, they didn't vote Green because they hated motorists. And in fact, a large percentage of them are motorists. They voted Green for other reasons. 
and and they, please. and they, I think, would object strongly if they discovered that the Greens wanted to punish motorists and hated motorists. And so, uh, look, we, we are simply saying that you need a sensible, balanced approach here uh, and not one based on hatred of a particular uh, group of travellers because of the mode of travel that they use. Uh, so we will continue to invest in bikeways and active travel. Uh, we will fix roads that have been damaged rather than closing them down. Uh, and uh, look, the, the Labor Party are snickering here, and I'm not sure why they're snickering, because I remember that you lost a seat on the weekend as well, um, and so I wouldn't be so smug if I was you. I wouldn't be so smug, particularly Councillor Cook, because the Greens are coming after you. They have got you in their sights. Uh, they've got you in their sights. Uh, Councillor Shree's mate is coming order, after please. you. Order, please. <laughs> order. <laughs> uh, so, um, look... Uh, you know, the weekend result is not um, a reason for anyone to be smug, uh, but to make sure that we're investing in sensible policies that support uh, a balanced approach right across the city. And that balance needs to be across all areas. And whether it's um, uh, active travel and, and, and transport modes, or whether it's um, practical support for environmental well, initiatives, Mayor, as we've continued to do. Your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Davis. Councillor Davis, on Sunday, the ever-popular Greenheart Fair was held in Victoria Park, which is also known as Barambin. Could you please update the Chamber on how this event went, including how events like this are keeping Brisbane clean, green and sustainable? Thank you. Councillor Davis. Uh, well, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, I thank Councillor Mackay for the question. It was great to see you, Councillor Mackay, uh, with your family on what was a glorious day uh, in Brisbane uh, at Victoria Park, Barambin, uh, for residents to come together and learn more about sustainable living. Mr Chair, the Greenheart Fair was officially opened by our Lord Mayor, and it was wonderful to have Auntie Theresa Williams give the welcome to country. Aunty Theresa was, has a very special connection to Victoria Park, Barambin, uh, and shared her story of when, 60 years ago as a child, she and her mother actually lived on the site. And Aunty Theresa also spoke about our future generations, so it was fantastic to see so many families uh, and young children at the event. 2022 actually marks the 14th year since the start of Green Heart Fairs, and uh, this year's event was our biggest yet, featuring 120 of Brisbane's leading sustainability experts who were ready to share with their tips and tricks on how to live a more sustainable and eco-friendly life. Over at the Green Home Living Zone, workshops were held on how to stop using plastics and how to renovate a Queenslander for energy efficiency. There were sessions on making sugar-free jam and DIY furniture using reclaimed timber. There were also workshops about setting up community gardens, helping bees thrive in your backyard and so much more. Uh, there was also um, a session uh, at the Green Home Living Zone where I had the opportunity to meet some of the uh, champion households who had participated in the Carbon Challenge and to hand out their certificates of completion. And it was fantastic to see so many people engaged uh, in reducing their, foot, their carbon footprint at home. And I look forward to uh, seeing more people uh, undertake those um, opportunities to reduce their footprint, starting by uh, taking the uh, carbon calculator to see where their start point is. Uh, there was also a whole zone dedicated to resilient homes. Uh, this area included our own flood hub, which is a mini resilient home, as you know, Chair, that showcases flood resilient design, as well as stalls from our Talk to a Planner team, the SES, Rural Fire Service and Evolved Construction. Next door at the Eco Kids Zone, where there were a range of activities for the children to enjoy that focused on sustainability, including a workshop on nature play weaving, little green thumbs, colourful minds, planting painting program and kite making and it was wonderful to see all the kids once they'd made their pikes their kites running up and down the um, the hills here at Vic Park 
But of course, the main act for the kid were performances by Dirt Girl and Scrap Boy, which got them all dancing and learning about sustainable living. At the event, we also had our first Junior Ranger Quest, which was inspired by the Junior Ranger uh, program uh, at Worrell Parklands. And more than 300 youngsters undertook the quest and on completion received their Junior Ranger pack, complete with badge and either a beeswax wrap or reusable sandwich wrap. Uh, there was also many putt-putt, giant games and mini soccer run by the little kickers, so plenty of things to keep the kids active and engaged. Mr Chair, the Green Heart Fair is committed to being a zero waste and has adopted a number of sustainable initiatives to reduce waste and contribute to a clean and green Brisbane, including a mug library where visitors at the fair could borrow a reusable coffee mug. Visitors who brought along their own reusable coffee mug received discounts for coffee at the fair. The Green Heart Fair was also free of single-use plastics with no plastic bags, straws or balloons, as well as no sale of single-use plastic bottles with visitors encouraged to bring their own bottles and fill up using the various refill stations uh, on the site. As the Chamber is aware, Council is transforming Victoria Park, Barambin, into a world-class destination to become a natural retreat, retreat and an urban park for adventure, discovery and reconnection. And at the beginning of this transformation, uh, what, the beginning of this transformation, should I say, was definitely on show this weekend. And it was great to be able to see so many people wandering uh, through the parklands, enjoying the views uh, and the space that is on, office, on offer, and uh, seeing so many people stand under the Victoria Park Barambin Arch with the city skyline in the background doing their Instagram moments was fantastic to see. Uh, we predict that there will be between 15 and 20,000 um, uh, people that attended on um, Sunday, so that's exciting. Uh, and the Victoria Park Barambin team are also on site to talk about the early projects that we will be having uh, at the park, including the Urban Pump Track and Spring Hill Common. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Thank Your you. time has expired. Further questions, Councillor Cassidy? Point, oh, sorry. Point, point of order. Your point of order, Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, just a procedural matter with respect to the agenda. Um, with respect to the answers to the question on notice, um, the answer at question five says that there's material provided to councillors uh, due to commercial inconfidence, but we don't have a separate piece of paper with those answers, which is normally how that info is provided. Could you please provide that to us? Okay, I'll follow through on that uh, question. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Cassidy, your question. Uh, thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Recently, in contracts coming to Council, we saw more than $63 million being spent on recruitment for temporary labour hire. That's $63 million promoting insecure work here in Council. That $63 million could be used to create secure, permanent in-house Council jobs uh, and even bolster Council's own HR team to ensure that works. Brisbane workers have families to feed, but you'd rather keep them wondering where the next pay check is coming from, Lord Mayor. Why do you continue to do this? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cassidy is so red hot on this issue that he still has to read his question out. Like, it's just, this is the same rubbish that he has raised again and again, and it is just, like, misleading in the extreme. The only, uh, I guess, people at the forefront of outsourcing in this place have been the Australian Labor Party. When they outsource the collection of rubbish and they outsource the grass cutting and they outsource the operation of city cat ferries. All of those things were outsourced under Labor and now they would have you believe that they suddenly don't support this approach. Of course they do, of course they do. Uh, but uh, what we see here is that Labor seems to see workers in two classes. And to Labor, the only important workers are the unionised permanent workers. They're, they're the only ones that Labor cares about. Why? Because unionised permanent workers pay their, la their fees to the union, which then goes to the Labor Party campaign. That's why they care about unionised workers, because that's how they fund their campaigns. Uh, that's where they get all their support from. And they don't care about other kinds of workers. They don't care about workers in local businesses that get contracts with council. They do not care about uh, social enterprises like Malthana, who clean our buses for us and do a fantastic job. Uh, they don't. 
Uh, they only care about unionised workers. Now, we care about all workers, which is why we ensure that there are ample opportunities for local businesses to do work for council. Because uh, we don't see those workers in two classes. We see them all as equal, and they all deserve a go when it comes to Point supporting local business. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yeah, the, Lord's Mayor, the Lord Mayor has been um, ranting and raving for the last minute or two now about contracts and small businesses and social enterprises. My question was about uh, $63 million worth of temporary labour hire contracts, which is a very different issue, and he clearly doesn't understand what his LNP administration is doing in creating two classes of Don't workers here in council. Can he answer that question? Yes. Can't debate the question, Councillor Cassidy, but Lord Mayor. We <laughs> order, please, all sides. As I was saying, uh, we don't believe there are two classes of workers. Uh, we don't believe that uh, people... Ca Councillor Cassidy, please. We don't believe uh, that people that um, do some short-time work for council are any less important than those permanent employees. <coughs> Councillor Cassidy does, and he's made it very clear that he sees them as less than. He sees them as lesser workers. He sees those jobs as less important. We do not. We see them as just as important uh, because they contribute just as much to the city as other kinds of workers. And so, Councillor Cassidy, what we're seeing here is we we diversify the amount of work that has to be done across the city between um, those short-term projects, uh, work that is done on a short-term basis, and then other kinds of work. But we also look at value for money as well. And if it is providing good value for money to, uh, to go with a local business or a local recruitment company uh, to engage services, then we should absolutely consider that. I was talking to uh, one of my other mayoral colleagues from South East Queensland uh, who was saying, oh, yeah, I, I heard um, your leader of the opposition, what's his name, um, banging on about outsourcing the work. He's like, that's the only way we do it. Why? Because when you outsource it, you get what you pay for and you can monitor it. And if you don't like it, you can go with someone else. And, and so that was, that was not my quote here. That was... That was that was another mayor of South East Queensland who, who was actually saying it was a good thing Point to do. Order, for Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, the question was about temporary labour hire workers, not about contracting out. The Lord Mayor is, is either confused or deliberately not answering the question. Can you draw him back to that? Lord Mayor. Uh, well, uh, what was the question? I mean, there, was there a question? There was, I heard a speech. Point of I, order. Heard, I heard some commentary, but I didn't actually hear a question. Um, Councillor Cassidy. The question was why do you continue uh, to create two classes of workers in Brisbane City Council in, in, continuing, in continuing this trend of putting labour hire workers alongside That's permanent employees? That's not a point employees. of order, Councillor Cassidy. The time for question time has expired. Thank you. Um, and Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination Committee report, please, 23 May. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 23rd of May 2022, 2022 be adopted. Seconded. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, 23 May 2022 be adopted. Lord Mayor. And, uh, uh, Councillor Cassidy, uh, following on from that question, um, he was asking why we do that because it's the best outcome for the ratepayers of Brisbane. Yeah. That's why. That's why we do it, because we can provide better services to the ratepayers of Brisbane. That's why we do it, uh, because there is no administration that has invested more in boosting and improving services that the residents of Brisbane get uh, than we have. And so that's why we do it. That's why we do it this way. This week, we'll see, uh, once again, um, our assets lit up to support some important causes. Uh, and last night we had the Sandgate Town Hall, Radcliffe Place, Brisbane City Hall, lit up in red for World MS Day. And for more than 60 years, MS Queensland has provided care and support to Queenslanders living with MS and other neurological conditions. 
Every year on the 30th of May, MS Day is celebrated globally. And tonight, Redcliffe Place, the Tropical Dome, Victoria Bridge and Story Bridge will be lit up in purple to support Darkness to Daylight. Darkness to Daylight is a 110 kilometre overnight event that will help raise awareness of domestic and family violence as DV Prevention Month comes to an end. On Wednesday, we'll be lighting up our assets again for National Reconciliation Week. Our bridges will be lit up in black, red and yellow, blue, green and white to commemorate this week, uh, uh, which um, uh, is something that we've previously lit up as well on other days. Uh, on Thursday night, we'll be lighting up the Story Bridge in green and white and red to celebrate Italy's National Day. Every year on the 2nd of June, uh, Italy celebrates uh, its National Day and uh, we're supporting our local Italian community uh, in their festivities for this important day. On Thursday night, we'll also be lighting up the Redcliffe Place, uh, Victoria Bridge and the Tropical Dome in purple to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Uh, this year, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth uh, will become the first Australian monarch to celebrate a Platinum Jubilee after 70 years of service. Uh, a truly remarkable uh, length of service and um, if you just consider all of the things that have happened in the last 70 years, um, it's been a time of incredible change and um, to be in that role for 70 years is a truly remarkable thing and I do think uh, Her Majesty is a truly remarkable lady. Uh, this Friday is Mabo Day and we'll be light, lighting up our assets uh, blue, green and white to celebrate the occasion. Uh, the decision on the high of the High Court, um, the famous Mabo decision, was on the 3rd of June 1992. Uh, and this decision, as we all know, paved the way for native title to make its way into Australian law. On Saturday night we'll be lighting up the Story Bridge, red, to support uh, world hemochromatosis. Uh, he sorry, hemo Chromatosis week. Uh, this disease is a result of an overload of iron and is purely genetic. Uh, it's the most common genetic disorder in Australia and affects one in 200 Australians. Uh, on Sunday, the Story Bridge will be lit up blue to celebrate the Brisbane Marathon Festival. Uh, this is the 30th anniversary of the festival and the organisers expect uh, around 8,000 runners to sign up to this event. This is something that we're supporting through the Brisbane Economic Development Agency and all funds raised go to Ronald McDonald House. It's great to be uh, out at Victoria Park Barambit on the weekend for the Greenheart Fair. Um, and it was, it, you know, it, was, it was a wonderful event, but what was even um, more wonderful uh, were those people who um, came out and said, oh, you suddenly turned green after the federal election. Well, hello. Uh, we've been doing this for 14 years. 14 years. And in fact, before the first Green Councillor was ever elected to Brisbane City Council, we were green. Um, and we've been running this wonderful Green Heart Fair across the suburbs of Brisbane uh, for well over a decade. Uh, why? Because we believe in it. We believe in practical environmental action uh, and the community believes in it too. And it was great to see so many people out there, not only enjoying the Greenheart Fair, but also exploring Victoria Park or uh, For many people who don't play golf, this is the first time that they've had a chance to, uh, to go in and walk the grounds of Victoria Park or And it is a truly special place. Uh, it is an amazing place. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the golfers obviously um, had run of it for a period of years, uh, but now everyone in the community um, has access to this wonderful green space and we're looking forward to uh, working with the community to roll out the master plan later on this year and, um, and then start the initial upgrades as we head towards the 2032 Olympics. Uh, I um, also just wanted to mention the significance of the unveiling of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander War Memorial in Anzac Square. Uh, this is something that was long overdue um, and it is in fact going to be, I understand, the last memorial of its kind in Anzac Square um, and I think it is fitting that it is the last because uh, when you think about all those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that served our nation, a nation that for a large period of time didn't give them basic rights, 
yet they volunteered, and sometimes they actually volunteered uh, by really not fessing up about um, their cultural background, um, to serve this nation and potentially die for this nation, it's incredible. It is an incredible thing. And um, as I said uh, during the week, the service of Indigenous or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in our military, I believe, was the start of a national conversation about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights. And, uh, you know, people rightly ask, if they can fight and die for our country, why don't they have basic rights? Uh, and so that started a, a long process, but I think, um, how can you argue with that question? How can you argue with it? Uh, so it is right that uh, there is now a permanent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander War Memorial uh, in Anzac Square, and that will be there for the generations. Uh, and just adds even more significance to what is an amazing sacred place in our city. And um, I want to thank everyone that's been involved in putting that uh, memorial together over a long period of time. Uh, we're obviously uh, one of the contributors financially to that memorial, along with the state government and others, uh, and it is just a wonderful thing. The items in front of us, uh, the report of the audit committee from 12th of May, um, this is uh, presented in line with the City of Brisbane regulation. The Audit Committee reviews Council's internal audit uh, processes um, and uh, they monitor operational risks as well as the control measures for those operational risks. Throughout the year, uh, Council works with the Audit Committee and the Queensland Audit Office to ensure we meet all of our audit requirements. Now, it's important to understand that there are three, there are three layers of accountability when it comes to audit. There is our own inter internal council audit processes, so the internal auditors in council. Then there's the independent committee, which is the one that we're getting the report from. And then the third layer is the Queensland Audit Office. And so three layers of accountability, uh, auditing potential risks and, and control measures and responses. Uh, and so we have an ongoing, very rigorous process uh, and that is something that continues uh, day in, day out, month in, month out, and will continue. And that doesn't mean that council is not without risk. There are always risks when we come to an organisation like this that delivers services over such a wide area, has so many employees, has so many different locations, offers so many different services. Of course, there are risks, uh, and it's all about making sure we have the processes in place to manage those risks. So that report is at item A. Item B is the lease of council land to community organisations. Uh, item B is seeking to renew or approval to renew leases with 42 different clubs and organisations. The City of Brisbane Regulation 2012 outlines that council cannot enter into a valuable non-current asset contract unless it first invites written tenders for the contract or offers the valuable non-current asset for sale by auction. Um, we know that the City of Brisbane regulation provides a number of exemptions that council may apply. And essentially what we're doing here is these organisations have existing leases, they are existing tenants in our facilities or on our land, and we're renewing those. Uh, and so this is the process of approving uh, those lease renewals. And so 42 different uh, incredible organisations across the city, uh, and I trust that all councillors will be supportive of this item. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on both these items and ask that they be taken seriatim for voting. Seriatim A and B for voting, yes. Yep. Uh, and as we just heard quite extraordinarily from this LNP Lord Mayor, but something we have suspected uh, for a long time, that he doesn't value council workers and uh, doesn't, think, doesn't think the people of Brisbane. Point of order. Point of order to you, Lord Claim to be misrepresented. No, the he doesn't think the people of Brisbane get good value for money from council workers. That's what he just said before. He said that by contracting out and getting labour hire workers, thank you. Said by contract, he said by contracting work out and getting labour hire workers instead of giving permanent secure jobs to people, that the people of Brisbane get better value for money. So to all those to all those council employees listening and watching along, we value you. We value you. And the LNP don't. Councillor Cassidy, the to LNP the items don't. before us, please. 
So, like usual, Chair, Clause A, the Audit Committee report, uh, there is very little information contained in what councils are being provided in the papers before us today. This LNP administration avoids transparency like the plague. The committee was given an entire presentation on the 2022 Brisbane City Council flood review. Uh, yet, as elected representatives, elected councillors, we weren't privy to any details about this presentation. And in fact, when we asked questions about the, um, the number of submissions that were made to this review, we were told uh, that uh, that couldn't be provided because it was somehow external to council. Yeah. That, that the council, this LNP administration, has no idea how many submissions were provided to uh, the, the flood review. Um, what was in those submissions, even though, even though an email address uh, was set up, which was flood review 2022 or something like that, at brisbane.qld.gov.au. So all of those submissions for the flood review, uh, which were discussed um, at this audit committee meeting, uh, yeah, there's no, there is no, there is no public records whatsoever uh, about. About these, about these submissions or about uh, the briefing that the audit committee received on the flood review. Uh, so you've got to ask yourself the question, why, why is this being kept so secret? Why, why is the LNP um, hiding the number of flood um, submissions uh, that were made, submissions that were made to the flood review and hiding details about what was discussed about that flood review at this audit committee? We also see in the audit committee as an update on council's high risk rating audit findings. So under the LNP, uh, council's net financial liabilities ratio is 203% and rated as higher risk, while the SEQ council's average was just 17.06%. So what we've known for a very long time is that this LNP administration, through their focus on themselves uh, and on these inner city projects that that see cost blow out and delay after delay and cost blow out, uh, that they are becoming a serious financial risk to the people of Brisbane. The net financial liabilities ratio again is 203%. Other Southeast, other Southeast Queensland councils are running at 17% currently. There's a footnote blaming changes on the accounting standards. Of course, they've been rolling that chestnut out for about the last three or four years uh, now, but even when you take that into that explanation into it, uh, it would be 127% twice the maximum level. So sure, these things are being ordered, and what they're finding is that this LNP, Lord Mayor Adrian Schroeder, and his LNP administration are a massive financial risk to the people of Brisbane. Hence, why we're going to see rates continue to climb. Uh, and people are going to see less and less delivered and less and less services out in the suburb for them. We also see councils, we're seeing it now, people can't even get their trees trimmed and their grass cut and their footpaths fixed uh, or their uh, busted and broken drains repaired. We also see the council's asset sustainability ratio is 80, over 80 per cent. Uh, and is rated at a moderate risk. That's probably a good one for this LNP administration when you look at it. Uh, and the most concerning uh, thing is that these ratios are showing a deteriorating trend. Uh, things are getting worse and worse under the LNP administration, which means that rates will be driven higher and higher and less and less will be delivered out in the suburbs. Uh, so we know from looking at any budget papers, any budget review, any annual plan and budget that this LNP administration uh, has uh, has left the people of Brisbane a huge amount of debt, a huge amount of debt, and, and people are starting to ask the question, is it all good value for money? Out in the suburbs, do they see a good return on their rates? When they saw the $650 million spent on Kingston Smith Drive, which is today a much more congested and slower road than it was before the upgrade. Uh, they see a metro project that was promised to be $944 million, and today that price tag is at $1.7 billion. And, and half a billion dollars committed to these inner city green bridges. And people can't even get broken tidal valves fixed by this LNP Lord Mayor. They have to wait three months and maybe six months to get a tree trimmed out in the suburbs. Parks aren't being mowed, and when they are being mowed, uh, 
it's a terrible, it's a terrible job in some places, and we've seen that. We've seen that right across the city. We've seen that right across the city, and footpaths languish, um, broken and busted, and inaccessible to so many people around the city. And so residents are, are, are more and more often asking that question: Are they getting good value for money out of the rates that this LNP administration is charging them? And, and when you see the debt levels rise to this level uh, for a council, to eye-watering levels and a diminishing return out in the suburbs, I think come 2024 people will cast that judgement very harshly on this LNP administration. Clause B is the lease of land to council and community organisations. Uh, this is for around 40 community leases around Brisbane. Um, these groups um, are all existing leasees, as we've heard, and many of them have called these facilities home for many years. Uh, the clause allows the valued organisations to renew their leases without having to go through the expressions of interest process every single time. We support uh, this, this clause, of course, and I, do, I think from memory, I'm not sure if I've got this wrong and Councillor Johnston will be able to correct me, but I think it's something, this issue is something that you have raised in the past around the process. Uh, following the change to the regulation. And I, I do remember the LNP uh, rubbishing those concerns that you raised at the time and saying, you were wrong, and they said, you were wrong, you were wrong, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a few months later, uh, they had to say, oh, yeah, she was right, actually, after all, and they had to bring these items through to council. Uh, at, and it's a step, it's a step it's supporting these organisations, so congratulations, Councillor Johnston. Uh, uh, supporting these organisations to having uh, these leases, and I've seen a few come through in my ward as well for uh, a uh, longer period after advocating for that uh, recently in my ward, uh, to step in the right uh, direction, of course. Um, but what we, what we have seen, what we have seen uh, throughout the pandemic and at the peak of the pandemic, uh, is this LNP Lord Mayor cutting grants for community clubs uh, and rolling, so getting rid of a whole lot of support, rolling up a few different um, previous programs into one and allocating less money to it and then claiming that the LNP was supporting community clubs. Uh, you know, we're getting used to seeing that. And last week we saw uh, this LNP Lord Mayor stand up uh, and crying about support for eight, eight out of 331 clubs that were uh, devastated uh, by the recent floods. Um, we've got the strange situation now of the East Brisbane, the former East Brisbane Bowls Club site that's uh, that, that process, unlike some of the other ones in um, former LNP federal seats that were cancelled, like the Inaugural Creek one, it's just been paused. Uh, and so the bulldozers are still sitting ready to come in and demolish that community facility over there. So while we, of course, support the lease uh, of community facilities to not-for-profit and community groups, uh, this LNP administration has proven uh, that they do the bare minimum, the bare minimum when it comes to supporting uh, these groups out in the community, and we should be doing so much more. Thank you. Uh, Lord Mayor, your uh, misrepresentation. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Cassidy incorrectly claimed that uh, I didn't support council workers I and I didn't say anything of the kind. Uh, in fact, I said uh, I don't see workers as two classes of workers depending on whether they're permanent or not, uh, and that I see all workers as equal. Um, and so he repeated that uh, misrepresent that he made that uh, inaccurate claim <coughs> twice. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Uh, um, I rise to speak to the lease of council land to community organisations at item B. Item B. And uh, I'd like to just uh, put on the record that uh, the, um, the eight organisations that were passed through this council chamber last week are just the beginning. It's a shame that those on the opposite side don't actually read the paperwork, don't actually understand the enormous work that has been done by our council officers in assessing what has been going on since our flood event. Um, it, you know, it's amazing the work that they've done and um, for them to so quickly get to the point where we can help those eight organisations is nothing short of uh, amazing and I want to congratulate those council officers for the work that they have done. Uh, the Shrina Council is proud to support more than 600 community organisations across Brisbane through the provision of council land, including clubhouses, sports and recreation facilities, fields and halls. And I'm proud to speak in support of item B, which seeks to provide ongoing security of tenure for 42 of our dedicated community organisations across Brisbane. 
These 42 lessees include community organisations from right across the city, including guides, clubs in, at Geebung, Tarragindi and Carindale, our dedicated scout branches in Cooparoo and Alderley, the harmonious Voices of Birali in Baden, the El Sarak Iraqi Association in Kurrabi, St Vincent de Paul Society in Brighton, the Walston Park Centenary Cricket Club in Richlands and the Graceful Croquet Club, just to name a few, Chair. Each of the 42 organisations before us today provide invaluable contributions to our local communities and, ask, and I ask today that all councillors <coughs> join me in supporting item B to make sure that they continue to do so with the full support of this chamber. Um, I just once again want to put on record uh, my appreciation to the hard work that all of our council officers right across uh, council have uh, done, particularly after the flood event, but uh, always they are out there working with those community organisations to make sure that we are supporting them. And uh, this is just one way that we are doing that. So I commend item B to the chamber. Thank you. Councillor Howe, further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on uh, item uh, a and item B. Um, I too, like Councillor Cassidy, find it uh, quite um, sad, really, that um, uh, unelected, uh, unelected uh, people on the uh, secret audit committee can get briefings on um, budget-related uh, financial issues out of the um, recent floods. Um, but it's very hard for councillors uh, to get that information. Um, we saw last week uh, massive cuts come through, um, no briefing for councillors, no discussion. Um, this LNP just used their massive majority to run uh, really substantial cuts to everyday uh, and critical operations within Brisbane, including things like mowing and tree trimming, and $13 million <laughs> out of a $30 million stormwater budget. I mean, um, the Lord Mayor might stand up in here and criticise the Labor Party for not talking about stormwater, but I can tell you for 11 years I've annoyed everybody in here about it. Um, and it is a shameful decision of this council um, that spends barely anything on stormwater management in this city to then cut almost half of the recurrent annual budget. And that is actually a bigger problem because of the rollovers from previous years and previous years and previous years. So actually a lot less is spent every year because of the financial mismanagement of this council administration. Uh, so it is, um, it is a real worry when uh, people who aren't elected and uh, who aren't actually responsible to the people of Brisbane can get briefings, but uh, councillors in this place uh, can't. Now, I just want to talk about uh, item B, the, um, uh, the, the leases, community leases. Um, firstly, <clears throat> um, uh, Councillor Howard seems to take everything as an attack upon the officers. Um, uh, Councillor Cassidy got up and, and made some remarks about the, the council leasing um, uh, process and how we've supported <coughs> clubs during the um, the floods, and uh, Councillor Howard has taken that as some attack upon the officers, which it's not. Um, I would just like to put on the record the following things. Uh, that firstly, um, there are three clubs in here uh, that are getting leases uh, in my ward, and that's a Graceful Croquet Club. There are 102. Um, they're a model organisation for how you should run uh, your association. They find it extremely difficult um, and get very little support from council. They had to manage their own structural repairs. This is a group of 50 elderly people. They had to do it. Council didn't do it for them. Council told them, here's $100,000. You go and manage a huge project. But that's fine. We're so pleased you're giving them another four years on their lease. Um, the Oxley Soccer Club. Um, we've asked for some bins for the Oxley Soccer Club and they've not actually turned up yet. Uh, and the uh, Oxley uh, Annalee Yoronga Country Women's Association. Again, <coughs> another extraordinary... I've got two CWA groups. Another extraordinary group. There's only about 15 members there. They run a hall. They manage their budget. Every now and then they ask council to trim the um, heritage listed tree in their front uh, yard because it's a huge tree in Yoronga Memorial Park. 
and it's such a difficult issue, council says, no, nope, it's your tree, you have to manage it. I want to put on the record the following. This council, from a policy point of view and a leadership point of view, is not supporting our community sporting clubs in the way that they should. No community sporting club should be left to do major structural repairs on their own. No community sporting club should have to manage heritage-listed trees, or um, like the poor scouts at uh, Yoronga Memorial Park have to do, 18 trees on the edge of their lease boundary. Their toilet block is not in their lease boundary, but apparently all these trees are. It is a massive mess what is going on. I do not think that is the officer's fault. I believe that is the fault of the people who are running the council, and that is the LNP <coughs> administration, who for nearly 20 years have had control of this council and have not done anything to make it easier for these small community groups to carry out their activities. And that's what they're here to do. They're not here to rebuild the substructure of the floor at the 103-year-old Braceville Croquet Club. They're here to play croquet. This administration has got it wrong for such a long time that they cannot see where the problem is. And then Councillor Howard um, stands up and says, oh, but we're only, we're, we're, eight, helping eight clubs is just the beginning. Well, I can tell you one of the hardest hit clubs in my ward was South Cricket. South Cricket came forward and asked this council for $17,000 to help them replace their electricals. And you know what this council said? No. This is a club flooded to the roof. All their grounds, all their lights, all their fences, all their equipment, the clubhouse, all the internals, all the cold rooms, all the kitchens. Senior club, junior club. And do you know what council's given them to date? $5,000 to clean up. That's it. Now, if this council was genuine about helping community groups, they would have started with the $17,000 one of our oldest sporting clubs in Brisbane needed, and they could have done that. But did they? No. They even put a proposal forward. They had the costings. They had exactly what they needed. And this council said no. Guess who else this council is saying no to or just being incompetent? For over two years, I've been calling for a lease for the Carrington Boat Club to come forward. Over two years. And again, um, many weeks ago now, I signed off on, for the third or fourth time, a lease renewal for them, this time for 10 years rather than four. They don't actually have a club anymore because it's completely gone. There were three walls left standing. Boats gone, pontoons gone, um, the roof off the, uh, the clubhouse gone, just completely gone. Um, now, councils announced money for them, but they don't have a lease. Over and over again, I've supported it, and it's still not come forward in the package today. Where is the lease for the Carrington Boat Club? I've signed off on it two years ago, again last year, again twice this year. Where is the lease for the Carrington Boat Club? Why does this tiny little sporting club in Brisbane, on the banks of the Brisbane River, keep getting ignored by council? Over and over again it's been raised every time this comes in here, and the Carrington Boat Club still don't have a lease. I know when I signed off on it. I've signed off on it multiple times over two years, and it's still not coming up. So, Councillor Howard and the Lord Mayor now he's wandered back into the chamber. Where's the lease for the Carrington Boat Club? How much longer does a tiny little flood-affected club have to wait for a lease? It's been more than two years that we've been asking. More than two years. Not having a lease affects what grants they can apply for. They've got to get a letter from council saying, oh, yes, we'll let them have a, a grant application. Do you know how much that complicates it for these poor groups trying to apply for funding? Do your work, get the Carrington Boat Club lease up here and support our local clubs. Secondly, put more in place to support these clubs. They should not be doing major structural works themselves. They should not be applying for grants to do the structural work. 
in any kind of lease arrangement. It is the owner that is responsible for managing these buildings. That is us, Brisbane City Council, and the groups are responsible for maintenance, not fixing structural problems, not um, trying to cut down heritage trees that they can't afford to do. This council does do things like this. So in my view, Councillor Howard, when you stand up and say, you know, Labor's attacking the officers, no, be clear. We're attacking you, and I'm attacking you, and the other LNP chairs, and the Lord Mayor, um, and all of the majority in here for failing to put the money where it is needed to support flooded clubs and failing to put the policies in place to support these groups to carry out their activities without the stress of having to manage major repairs. Um, it is wrong the way this uh, administration treats clubs. Um, and I, if there's a change coming in this council at some point, any other, any other administration at some point in the future, looking at how to better support community clubs has got to be one of the number one issues on the list. Because I know, and everybody else here knows, that uh, volunteers are finding it harder and harder to do this work, whereas this council has the power and the resources to do it properly and isn't. Thank you, further speakers. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I rise to speak on item B today, and I do actually rise to speak on item B and what is actually in the report uh, compared to some other people. And I would like to thank the officers and the work that they have done over the last several years, which have been difficult times during COVID, difficult times because the clubs have had difficulties uh, with COVID and the weather, but also some of those clubs have been very difficult to contact during the COVID times as well. Um, I am very proud to say that there are five clubs within my local ward that are on this list today, and they are five <coughs> amazingly um, coordinated and uh, dedicated clubs that do wonderful work right across uh, the community. First of all, I'll put the first two together, the Brisbane Visual Arts Community and the Girl Guides. They're both in Weller Road Park. Um, fantastic, small but effective clubs that have benefited from some fantastic access and inclusion upgrades over the last several years from council that have made them even more accessible to people of all abilities, uh, whether they are artistic and want to go out and show their inner creative, or the young girls who um, pop down after Wellers Road um, State School has finished and join in um, their Girl Guides activities for the afternoon. Again, small groups, but dedicated groups that do an absolutely amazing job. The Tarragindi Tigers, are a very large soccer club that are definitely bursting at the seams um, since COVID and uh, work across several schools as well for their fields. Uh, they have a brand new clubhouse that uh, was um, built with the support of the state and the federal government and then us through leasing as well. And I can assure you that the Tarragindi Tigers would not at any time um, consider that they have any issues with council and the support they get for the maintenance, the upgrading and the work that they need around their fields. Um, the team down there of Tarragindi Tigers do an amazing job. They've got their irrigation in there as well, and with the new clubhouse, they're going from strength to strength. They will def definitely appreciate the extension, um, continuation of this lease. Blue Care, again, a slightly different, not a community club, but definitely a community group that does amazing work within the community, um, looking after those people whose carers need some respite. So I've had some fantastic morning teas and birthday parties. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had the 107th birthday of a beloved local resident. Um, we're hoping to hit the 109th or 110th this year now that we've gotten out of COVID lockdown as well. But Blue Care do some amazing work and they've been for over um, 20 years at this site on Logan Road, supporting those carers who need a little bit of time out. And recently have also worked with council on that site to establish their own men's shed. So they're across the road from my very large Malkavat men's shed and they have a secondary campus over there to help those with um, special needs and high um, care needs as well to be able to be active in the men's shed. And last but by no means least, the Holland Park Sport and Rec, uh, formerly known as Holland Park Bowls Club. Uh, they benefited out of the amalgamation with the Linden Bowls Club, which was sold to the Ukrainian community, which is down in uh, Holland Park. They established themselves as the Holland Park Sport and Rec Club. And here is an example of a 
club going from strength to strength during COVID. As a sport and rec club, they obviously still have bowls. That is very, very important. They obviously still have a bar that sells beers at 1990s prices. Uh, they also have an air-conditioned hall, which they are generating revenue by hiring that out as well. They have a coffee shop um, that is open in the, in the morning now, which caters for the neighbouring school's parents when they come in. And uh, they are looking for strength to strength for other um, co-located surfaces on their site as well. Uh, they last year celebrated their 80th birthday and it was wonderful to be there with Bronwyn Graham and the team as well. These five clubs um, will generally, genuinely uh, appreciate the extension of their lease. Some of them for looking for a bit of a longer lease in the coming years, which I know we can start working through now that this has been sorted. But I thank uh, the officers for the work that they've done with my clubs in this area and I recommend the report to the Chambers. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Three. Thanks. Just on item B with the club list, uh, really quickly, there's one um, club venue that's not listed there, unfortunately, which is the East Brisbane Bowlers Club, and I don't want to reopen a long debate about that, but I did just want to highlight um, that the, the building itself has been closed for quite a, a while now, and I'm worried that it's, it's going to get a bit musty in there and mouldy, uh, and I hope Councillor Howard could look at sending down some council officers to at least open the windows and ventilate the space. So whatever we decide to do with it, just don't let it get mouldy in the meantime. Thanks. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item B, the lease of land to community organisations. As has been previously raised in this chamber, item B is seeking Council's approval to renew leases with 42 community organisations. Item B is seeking Council's approval to apply this extension so that we can continue with lease negotiations with these 42 valued community organisations, including the wonderful and much valued Fig Tree Pocket Equestrian Club based in that special part of Brisbane that is Fig Tree Pocket. The FTPEC is based on about 40 acres nestled between the river to the west and Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary across the road to the east. The club offers a wide range of events for a variety of equestrian sport disciplines, including international events. Unless I'm very much mistaken, my memory is that this is the only internationally accredited equestrian park within Brisbane. And it's very interesting, Chair, to remember that uh, former Labor Lord Mayor Clem Jones was going to turn this little area into a housing estate, and I'm led to believe that Sally Ann Atkinson saved it. Uh, in early 2020, Fig Tree Pocket Equestrian Club was awarded a grant through Brisbane City Council's Building Stronger Communities program to improve club governance and long-term sustainability. Council has further been able to support the club through managing the impact and recovery from this year's flood event, with the club gaining access to both a sport and rec officer support and by receiving funding under Council's Community Facility Disaster Relief Program. Just last week, I went down and enjoyed a late afternoon meeting with the new exec at the club. Sally, the new president, and Heidi, the new secretary, took me on a tour of the property and showed me around the facilities. The new exec is planning big things between now and the Olympics. They would love to position themselves as a contender for training and preparation location for the Brisbane Olympics. Considering it's only 14 kilometres from the city centre, the FTPEC is ideally positioned to offer facilities not only for riders, but the wider community. The club regularly hosts community social nights, engagements and entertainment. Sally has a vision to engage the community with options possibly such as social memberships and using the facilities as local meeting spaces. Approval of this item will allow <coughs> us to provide continued security for the club and the community. This will provide a positive outcome and I know the community is much loved. Correction. The facility is much loved by the community and valued by neighbours near and wide. I commend item B to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor McCoy. Further speakers? Councillor Landers. Thank you, Chair. I also rise to speak on item B and to support the lease uh, with Brackenridge Cricket. Uh, the Brackenridge Cricket Club was established in 1983 and hold the lease at McPherson Park in the heart of Brackenridge. The clubhouse was actually built by the club members themselves and there are some great photos uh, within the clubhouse on the walls that um, show some progressive shots 
of that, uh, of that being built. And some of the members in the photos are still actually there and are now life members, such as Mark Jennings and Kian White, who work hard to maintain the field and keep the club running. And invariably, if I'm at McPherson Park, um, McPherson Park I will always run into one of them. Uh, the membership is currently made up of 70 juniors and 40 seniors and the club plays in summer under the QSDCA or the Queensland Sub-District Cricket Association and in winter under the WCA or Warehouse Cricket Association. So Chair, I am very happy to support this lease being renewed and I know the club will welcome new players at any time. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? No. Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, well, just briefly, um, in relation to a couple of items that came up uh, in discussion, uh, it's interesting because I, I would recommend through you, Mr Chair, that Councillor Cassidy familiarises himself with the story of the boy who cries wolf, uh, because I think it's very relevant here, because for years and years he's been saying these outrageously untrue things to the point where now no one believes him. And if there was actually ever a legitimate issue that he were to raise, um, he might find himself in a, in a spot of bother. Uh, because for years and years, he's been making untrue claims about uh, the uh, investment in basic services, the state of the council budget, which is uh, incredibly strong given the sheer volume of infrastructure that we're investing in, plus uh, the financial shocks that we've had with uh, the COVID pandemic and floods. Uh, there is no other level of government that has a better and stronger budget than we do. It's just not. Uh, yet Councillor Cassidy um, continues to uh, say these patently untrue things about the state of our budget and what we invest in. And so uh, just a word, of, a word of warning or maybe a word of wisdom. Uh, boy who cried wolf. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, um, brush up on that story. Uh, I, it, it's funny because as a former finance chair in this place, I remember like even 15 years ago, uh, Labor councillors were saying, oh, the debt's out of control. It's going to send the city broke. Oh, we're all doomed. Remember that? Kim Flesser. Uh, Kim Flesser used to say those things. Uh, and we, we referred to him as Chicken Little at the time. But the sky did not fall in. And in fact, what happened since then is we invested in record infrastructure, uh, billions of dollars worth of infrastructure were built, and guess what? The budget remains strong, and we invested records, uh, record amounts into the suburbs of Brisbane. And so uh, we will continue uh, to make sure that we're investing for the growth of the city. Uh, and we continue to, because the state government continues to fob off their own responsibilities, uh, they, can't even, they can't even deal with basic things that they are responsible for, like the health system, the education system or public housing. They can't do that well, uh, but they still continue to put other responsibilities onto councils, in particular Brisbane City Council, uh, the biggest one being public transport, where they are responsible for public transport, yet they have vacated the field when it comes to any investment in the bus network, any investment in the busway network, uh, and uh, that leaves the only people that are willing to do anything is us. It would be wonderful if we had $1.7 billion free to invest in other things. It would be wonderful, wouldn't it? We could do amazing things with that, but guess what? We can't because the city will grind to a halt if we don't invest in our public transport system. And so we have to. And it's not just that we have to, it's the right thing to do. And so we're doing it. Uh, now, other councils don't have anywhere near those responsibilities. Other councils don't build major roads or public transport projects. Other councils uh, aren't expected to do those things. Um, and so we have a very different role and uh, we accept that role. We'd like to see more support from the state government and other levels of government, but we're, we've always been willing to step forward and to cater for the needs of our growing city, and we will continue to do so. Uh, in relation to uh, the issues that Councillor Johnston raised, uh, I will say um, that uh, 
I think in some respects some of the issues that she raised are very legitimate and some that have been uh, of concern to us and as, as an administration. Uh, our clubs and community and sporting groups across the city have um, varying capacities to, uh, I guess, invest, reinvest in facilities uh, and raise money. Some are absolute professional machines that, you know, they, they have a plan to upgrade facilities, they raise the money, they make it happen, uh, they do amazing things, but not all clubs have those same capabilities. And so uh, as we go through the rebuilding and recovery process from the floods, one of the things that we are looking at is how we can uh, make lease arrangements work better for our community and our clubs. And so that would mean um, uh, looking at changes where clubs just do not have the capability to take on maintenance responsibilities that other clubs might, uh, that we look at a process that sees them uh, on a different arrangement. And so uh, we are very focused on improving this situation. And it, it, by all means, the clubs that our city has range from the very smallest organisations with very few members and very uh, little ability to raise money up to these major organisations that, that are just um, so professional. Kedron Wavell Services Club would be one example. Uh, Easts down in um, Stones Corner, another example. You know, th these are big organisations, professionally run, that, that can pump money back into facilities in the community, and they do, and it's a great outcome, but not, not all organisations are the same. And so uh, what I can uh, assure Councillor Johnson of is that our, our modified approach going forward will be taking that into mind very carefully, and we'll be looking at how we can support those smaller organisations that have less capacity uh, to, to do the fundraising and invest in their facilities. And so, uh, so we will very much be focused on that, Councillor Johnston, uh, and I think it will be a very positive thing uh, for the City of Brisbane. Thank you, councillors. We now move to the vote on the ENC report in two parts. Item A, all in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Division. called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming. Thank you. Eyes to the right, nose to the left, please. Ring the bells. Thank you. Thank you, clerks. Please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and six against. Thank you. Turn to your seats, please. We now move to the vote on item B. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, uh, I move the uh, suspension of standing orders uh, to enable me to move uh, an urgency motion uh, calling on Brisbane City Council to introduce a new rating category for residential owner occupiers, uh, creating a new class of natural disaster affected uninhabitable homes, and that rates are set at 25% of the amount usually levied under the resolutions of rates and charges for a period of up to 12 months. Seconded. Councillor Johnson, you're moving a suspension of standing rules under 12.3. You must establish why you weren't able to include this motion for Point debate order, on the agenda. Mr Chair, I, I can actually clarify that we, we already do this and we have the capability to do this. Well, the motion is for yes. suspension of standing rules. Yes. That's the first vote. Yes. Um, there's a motion for the suspension of standing rules. All in favour of the suspension of standing rules? You can have three minutes to establish why 
you want to suspend standing rules? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'd be very interested in a debate if the Lord Mayor is going to allow such a debate. Um, but the reason I'm raising this motion today is in question time, the Lord Mayor indicated that the budget has not yet been finalised for 2022-2023. Um, we've had another uh, major natural disaster in the city uh, with the big floods, but there could be other natural disasters in the city. Um, it's come to my attention that this council will not offer substantive rates relief for homeowners whose homes are uninhabitable. Um, I have made a request uh, for um, residents in my area uh, where there has been a major landslip and their homes have been rendered uninhabitable. Uh, and council has said no. They've said the only money available to these uh, people is the $250 rebate. So if what the Lord Mayor is saying is true um, in his interjection earlier, that there already is provision to um, make rates relief for uninhabitable homes, um, there is a very serious problem with why I'm being told that it's not available to residents with uninhabitable homes. Um, so I think we need to have a debate. The Lord Mayor can hop up and tell me why I'm wrong. Um, but I want to make sure that those residents whose homes are uninhabitable um, get true rates relief relief and it is quite urgent because there's still an opportunity to set up um, a provision of this kind in the 2022-2023 budget as the Lord Mayor has said it's not finalised. Thank you. Councillors, the uh, motion before us is for the suspension of standing rules. All in favour please say aye. 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 Any opposed please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Johnson, uh, your motion please. Thanks. I'll be uh, I'll be quick. Wasn't really expecting that, but anyway. Are you, uh, are so you look, circulating that? So is it? This that's it. it. That's yep. it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, okay. So I've got a handwritten motion here. Um, I I'm, can... I'm happy to repeat it. It's pretty straightforward. It basically is asking for a new okay. category of rates uh, to be uh, set up in the next budget. Uh, for it to be levied at 25 per cent of uh, the usual rating category uh, for that person. And this would be a, available for residential uh, occupier, owner occupiers, I'm sorry, uh, for some real rates uh, relief for them. It's been seconded. Oh, seconded. Oh, seconded. Oh, I could have just read it all out again if you wanted me to. Okay, all right, I've got, I've got my copy. All right, um, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, Point of order, Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair, as per section 42 2B of the meeting's local law 2001, I move a procedural motion that the debate on the motion now before the meeting be adjourned until the conclusion of today's business on today's agenda. Seconded. Mr Chair, you don't have your microphone on. You don't have your microphone on, sorry. Thank you. All right. My apologies, I turned the mic off to talk to the clerks. Um, I'll repeat what I just said. Uh, we have a procedural motion before us to move the motion that has been agreed to to the end of today's meeting uh, at the conclusion of today's agenda. All in, can I ask you all, please, all in favour of that motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, councillors, we move on with the rest of the agenda, which is the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Game Committee report. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the meeting held on Tuesday the 24th of May 2022 for the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting dated Tuesday 24 May 2022 be adopted. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, as is uh, required and as I want to share uh, about the World Unions of Olympic City meeting that I did last week, uh, it does relate, obviously, to the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And I want to uh, share with the Chambers the wonderful opportunity there was 
to work with other Olympic cities to get to know other coordinators of OCOGs past, present and ones that are coming up like us as well and share so many ideas around Olympic legacy and legacy activation over the three days that we had in Athens. Uh, the World Union of Olympic Cities is um, founded by the city of Athens and the city of Lausanne. Um, so therefore represented by the mayors of both those cities, but strongly supported by the IOC. And that was clearly seen in their presence there at all the functions as well. Um, it was wonderful, as I said, to socially meet um, the representatives, particularly the uh, vice mayors and mayors of those cities that have hosted Olympics. Uh, in the recent past as well, but also to have a look at some of the working sessions that we went through as well. In particular, a standout of one of the working sessions was from Olympic legacy to legacy activation. So this was an IOC presentation on the report of the use of Olympic venues. So the International Olympic Committee has tracked the post-games use of over 900 Olympic venues at 51 summer and winter editions of the Olympic Games from Athens, 1896, right through to Pyeongchang in 2018. Um, so it was very interesting to hear about what had happened to Olympic venues when games come to end. Um, obviously changes from the 20th century to the 21st century as well and uh, how that they can best be used to serve their local communities going forward. Now, this report came out of, obviously, the decision by the IOC to have a new norm, and you can see the distinct difference. When the early 20th century, there's only 21% of the Olympic um, sites still in use, but that's to be expected with the end of life. Um, some of them damaged by war and a lot of them damaged by weather and too expensive to replace. But from the uh, 21st century, 92% of the permanent um, sites are still used um, for the communities uh, across the cities that have held the Olympics. And the existing and temporary venues going forward in Paris, Milan, LA and Brisbane have got well over 83% of those venues being used now for sport and planning to be used for the future as well. So there's a lot of learnings out of that and conclusions on how we can make sure that any new events and uh, new venues that will be delivered through the Olympics are definitely something that's going to fit in to Brisbane and what we need as well. Uh, in particular, uh, making sure that they're multiple use, they're not something that's just for a single sport, that we work with all stakeholders, and that's just not government stakeholders, but private partnerships or community and sporting groups as well and make sure that they are adapting to the time as well. So obviously venues that are new, and we're thinking here of the Albion precinct, uh, are ones that will definitely be what we need uh, for 2032 to 2042, but how that they will get regularly updated to meet the needs of our growing city and their healthy and active choices going forward as well. In saying that, we also then also had the Mayor's Roundtable discussion, which was based on exactly that the active uh, cities, the Olympic City's health and physical activity commitment. And that was uh, a wonderful opportunity to join with many of the mayors that were uh, there in person and online as well. As I said, Athens and Lausanne, obviously, but also Barcelona, Vice Mayor, um, Chamonix, Mont Blanc, Lake Placid, St. Moritz, several IOC members and the Vice Mayors from Los Angeles and Paris. Um, this was a round table uh, commitment that we all signed to make sure that since COVID has led to such a sedentary lifestyle that we really were prioritising physical activity as a solution and embedding it in our um, city's um, social fabric. Uh, I was very proud to present uh, a five minutes on what Brisbane does in this space and I can assure you even at an LA level and a Paris level we are streaks ahead when it comes to the level of healthy and active programs that we provide for free or very low cost um, to our residents, how many venues we have and how much activity our residents actually do. I think our climate obviously is a large part of that, but everybody was uh, very impressed to say the least of how much we already work with our stakeholders. We utilise our existing resources and more than anything, we promote um, physical activity through commuting with providing safe footpaths, green bridges, bikeways, and everything else we do in between as well. So it was wonderful to hear what the other cities are doing, what they're planning to do out of their legacy from the Olympics, particularly from Paris 
and LA and uh, take away some tips on how we can move forward with that as well. So we do have representatives from Barcelona coming over later in the year and uh, representatives from the city host office talking with all of those cities over the next 12 months to make sure we can get that legacy right. Uh, as far as back in Brisbane, though, the business hub is uh, humming as always. There is one, um, just one event that is actually on in the next week, and that is on tomorrow at 9.30 a.m., Build Your Business Despite the Chaos, a women's guide to success and sanity. Uh, we've had a recent few great events um, actually in the business hub. One of them was the evening with the Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner on the Lord Mayor's Women in Business Grants celebration. It was wonderful. Um, as the Lord Mayor will attest, to see so many uh, successful grant applicants really talking about the valuable support that we provided to them and specifically to those ones that were small and micro businesses as well. So there is a lot of uh, inspiration that's coming out of the Business Hub through our support and through our grants programs and our ongoing mentoring um, through that hub as well. As it comes to the report last week, um, I wasn't there last week, but we were talking about the Suburban Business Hub and, of course, another great success of the Schrinner Council to make sure that we had feet on the ground in the northern suburbs to make sure that we have support for all of those businesses that need it, whether it's a talk to the planner, food licensing, business liaison offices, networking in the suburbs, suburbs monthly local business morning teas and a series of other activities. We've had over 1,600 people that have come through the hub um, to date since it's been set up, and I'm sure there'll be many more. Uh, it's a great opportunity to have a set place that we can set up for workshops and events in the northern suburbs. Uh, and it's been officially opened in May last year, so it's just had its 12-month uh, anniversary. And uh, we look forward to seeing far more free events, workshops and masterclasses, not just for businesses on the, on the south side. People can come from all over Brisbane. Um, if they don't come into the business hub in town, Nanda is there for them as well. And of course, we continue with our programs right across the city as well. Um, I will leave the report to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Landers? Afternoon tea. Oh, no, no, well, are we going to move to the, no further speakers? Okay, I'll move to the, the, the vote on the report. Okay. Um, as there are no other speakers, I now move to the, the vote on this report. Uh, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Please say no. The ayes have it. Now, Councillor Lane. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the meeting adjourn for a period of 15 minutes for afternoon tea. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move that the report of the Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 24th of May, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Murphy and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 24 May, 2022, be adopted. Councillor Murphy. Mr Chair, last week the Transport Committee received an update on one of the centrepieces of the Metro project, uh, which is the Adelaide Street uh, Tunnel. The Schrinner Council's vision to deliver uh, a world-class transport system for our city very much hinges on the critical infrastructure in the heart of the CBD, which is the Adelaide Street Tunnel. Our terribly congested bus network has been crying out for some relief for a very long time, as the Lord Mayor uh, said the state government has essentially uh, vacated the field when it comes to funding infrastructure on our uh, busway network. Currently, Adelaide Street is one of our major public transport thoroughfares, but congestion on the Victoria Bridge and our inner city stations are choking our busway network. This tunnel will provide a dedicated public transport corridor between the city's south and north, alleviating surface congestion and allowing us to revitalise Adelaide Street. Construction on the tunnel has been underway since uh, last September, and later this week we will reach another milestone in the construction of the tunnel, with the second half of the piling works to commence.
With 50% of piling now complete, it is time for construction to switch to the other side of Adelaide Street to allow works to be completed on the other half of the tunnel portal. And if any councillors or chairs have been up to the top of uh, Adelaide Street in the last few days, uh, near where it meets with North Quay, they will see already a lot of the scaffolding and false work has been removed from that side uh, of Adelaide Street. Uh, and you can see uh, part of what will be the completed uh, roof of the dive structure there, and it looks uh, quite an impressive. It looks like quite an impressive piece uh, of engineering. The traffic changes that are currently in place at Adelaide Street and North Quay will remain in place. However, through traffic will be reallocated to the Brisbane Quarter side of Adelaide Street to allow for works to be completed outside Brisbane Square from the 6th of June. Following the completion of piling, work uh, will turn to the tunnelling phase, where canopy tubes. Uh, and sprayed concrete will be used to create the tunnel profile. The tunnel will then be ex uh, excavated in one metre sections using a mined tunnelling solution which was chosen in order to minimise disruption to businesses, pedestrians and commuters. While I'm on the topic of construction, Mr Chair, I also wanted to just briefly talk about some of the works that are upcoming in the city's south. Metro uh, includes a number of upgrades to key stations along the busway, including Buranda, the Cultural Centre Station and UQ Lakes. We know, uh, Chair, that the Cultural Centre Station is one of the most important stations in our bus network, and currently that's where most connections between the north side and south side services take place, or where north side and south side interchanges take place, I should say. But this station is also at capacity and everybody who catches a bus in Brisbane will know uh, that Cultural Centre Station can get heavily congested, especially during peak times. So we will be transforming the Cultural Centre Station and the surrounding area to improve the efficiency and the throughput for our customers there. We'll also be revitalising the streetscape and providing upgraded walkways and cycling pathways. Last year we completed our early works program in South Brisbane by relocating sewer infrastructure and completing an uh, upgrade of four different intersections within the South Brisbane precinct. Uh, while we always do our best to minimise construction impacts, to support these works there will be some changes to uh, traffic in and around the station itself. Residents will have already noticed an increased project presence in the area with some site facilities ha having already been established. The first stage of major construction will start next month, meaning some traffic changes will be implemented from Thursday this week. These works will form stage one of the major works at South Brisbane and will involve service relocation, uh, some intersection upgrade works, uh, as well as construction of the lift shaft near QPAC. To facilitate these works on Grey Street and Melbourne Street, a number of changes will be required during construction. Grey Street will be reduced to one lane of traffic in each direction between Russell Street and Peel Streets. Melbourne Street will also be closed to general traffic between Hope Street and Grey Street. This means that general traffic travelling uh, towards Grey Street will need to detour via Hope Street northbound or Maryvale Street southbound. For cyclists, a shared pedestrian and cyclist route will be maintained via Fish Lane through the Cultural Centre precinct. Stage two will commence later this year and involve some additional changes to the Cultural Centre bus station that I will share with the Chamber at a later date. I encourage residents and commuters that frequent the CBD to continue to monitor Council's website to ensure they're aware of the changes coming into effect. I want to thank res residents and visitors in advance for their patience during these traffic changes which are necessary for us to construct uh, what is the most transformative public transport infrastructure project in Queensland. Thank, thank you, you. Further debate? Further debate? Councillor Three. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just on the Metro report as well, I'm obviously excited to see this project progress in. There are two issues I wanted to flag, though. One is just that the combination of all the different uh, areas that are being used as layover for the Metro is actually starting to add up to quite a big chunk of parkland that's being taken away from the community. So between Kurilpa Point Park, where there's a layover area, and then around South Bank Parklands, there's another big layover area. And then meanwhile, the Queen's Wharf Casino Bridge has fenced off another chunk of South Bank for a layover area. And then just back one street on Melbourne Street, that whole corner has been fenced off. So it's interesting to reflect on the fact that for the next kind of two, two and a half years, multiple different green spaces around the area have been fenced off from public access. Um, and that maybe would be okay if this was a one-off thing, but this is part of a broader pattern where we continue to use public parkland for construction site storage and layover facilities, etc. Um, and it would be nice if, as part of a project budget, the council 
just arranged with some other developers who have vacant sites and said, look, let's just turf this block of land and turn it into a temporary park for the next two years because the developer's just waiting to develop it anyway and it doesn't have anything else to do with the land. And council could rent those blocks at a nominal rent and maintain them and keep them secure. Um, this is something that happens in a lot of other cities around the world where you say, look, we're going to work with the industry so that these sites, rather than sit in derelict and vacant, we'll turn them into temporary parks. And that helps off-site uh, offset the negative impacts of so much parkland being closed off to the public. Um, I'm pretty frustrated about Kurilpa Point Park in, in particular because it was fenced up for quite a while for some other construction work projects. And then just when it reopened and the fences came down and they put in new turf, then Metro comes along and says, oh, we're fencing this off again. So I think in the last kind of four or five years, we've only had about six months where that park has been open to the community. That's pro um, Yeah, anyway, that, I'll leave that point there. The other issue I wanted to flag is just in terms of the road closures. Um, I'm concerned that the alternative cycling route uh, for, or the alternative route for pedestrians and cyclists via Fish Lane is not safe and not practical. Um, the volume of cars that are currently using Fish Lane, particularly to service the, um, some of the hotels and restaurants along there, but also uh, as an access to their driveways, that volume of cars is quite high now. And I think the, I worry that the Metro team has underestimated just how many pedestrian and vehicle conflicts there could be along that, that little laneway. Um, there's a few points along the laneway, for example, where there are construction sites at the moment, so there's a lot of hoarding and fencing up and, and not much visibility around the corners as well. And so I, I hope that the team has kind of done their homework and made sure that this is actually a safe alternative route for cyclists and, and pedestrians. Um, the volumes that are using, that currently use Melbourne Street and that will be diverted to these areas aren't, aren't huge. It's not sort of massive volumes, but there are enough cyclists and pedestrians that currently use those main um, routes that are being closed off and, and that will be enough to cause a bit of a, a few issues on Fish Lane. Um, as always, my preference is that we take away a, a few bays of parking and create some dedicated um, bike lanes on some of the other corridors, even if only temporarily. Um, and uh, personally, I'd be quite supportive of uh, closing Fish Lane to cars during the peak hours um, because it's, uh, there are alternative routes available and, and you could quite quite easily say, look, at this, during peak hours, this is a pedestrian and bike route, and outside of those peak hours, then cars can come in and the loading vehicles can come and service the restaurants and all that sort of stuff. I'm talking specifically about the stretch of Fish Lane closest to Melbourne Street and not the other end of Fish Lane, which is also driveway access for residential apartments. Please don't misquote me on that later, Councillor Wines. Um, I'm, I, I'm just trying to give good faith suggestions here, and it's a bit disappointing sometimes when I make reasonable suggestions and they're taken out of context and then Els off giving press releases to the media um, as a way to try and score cheap points. So I'm, I'm just raising a g genuine legitimate issue here and offering practical solutions. Um, the, the, there is a lot of um, disruption happening around that side of the Victoria Bridge and I hope, um, I hope the council officers are, are thinking really carefully about how best to mitigate and manage that. Um, as stated previously, I'd, I would strongly support closing off um, and cul-de-sac in the Grey Street intersection where it, it meets Melbourne Street. I don't think that needs to remain open to cars long term, and I think it's um, really disappointing that big institutions like QPAC and perhaps South Bank Corporation to some extent have prioritised profits from their underground car parks ahead of the general public interest. It would be better for the entire South Bank precinct if Grey Street did not function as a through corridor for cars and instead was a local access road route for local traffic. Um, and it, it would in fact save the Metro project a lot of cost and a lot of hassle if the Met Metro project didn't have to keep Grey Street open through the um, Melbourne Street intersection for the duration of construction at the very least. So just wanting to restate that I am supportive of closing off that um, section of Grey Street either temporarily or permanently um, in order to facilitate the Metro project. And I think council should go back to organisations like QPAC and Queensland Museum and just say, look, are you sure we can't close this off for a couple of months? Um, just to make it that little bit easier to undertake this work. Um, looking at the sort of construction schedule and, and some of the plans of how this thing's going to be staged, it just seems quite obvious to me that if the council was willing to close off Grey Street, 
at least temporarily do, during the construction period, um, you'd save a lot of time and a lot of hassle for your own contractors and, and your own project team. Um, and it seems like the arguments in favour of keeping it open are pretty emotional. They're not based on um, a, a robust analysis of the transport network or the needs of the area. So maybe there's a case there to be, um, yeah, looking a bit more closely at that opportunity. Uh, also still hoping to see the, uh, the, the free bus loop that was announced to come, sooner, come through a little bit sooner. Um, originally the proposal from council was that the bus loop would start um, to help mitigate some of these disruptions and road closures and impacts to businesses, et cetera. So if all, these, all, if all this work is starting now and we're gonna see all these disruptions to the precinct, why isn't the bus, that free bus loop being introduced now? Why is that being delayed until the end of the year? Maybe Councillor Murphy can shed a little bit more light on the timing of that free bus route because that's being funded out of the Metro project and I think is a fairly important piece of the puzzle to ensure that disruptions from the construction are minimised. Thanks. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. And at significant risk of sometimes the Transport Committee report being a conversation uh, had between Councillor Shree and myself, uh, I'll just uh, cover off on a few of those uh, questions. Just in respect of the Kirilpa Point uh, lay-down facility, uh, the Metro team appreciate that, uh, that these site facilities may cause an inconvenience, but they are very necessary for construction of the project at this location. Uh, in terms of Council Street's suggestion that we use uh, car parks and, uh, and vacant land and other facilities, uh, well, I can say um, we're already doing that. So uh, in this area, we have uh, placed necessary site facilities in uh, car parks, in unused utility service areas, uh, and indeed on top of a disused sewer, uh, sewer main station. So uh, it's not just parkland that we use uh, when it comes to using vacant land uh, for the purposes of lay down areas. But I want to make the point that the Brisbane Metro project as a whole includes very significant public realm improvements uh, for the South Brisbane area, which includes wider footpaths and additional uh, vegetation. Of course, there is um, a pocket park as well at uh, 125 Gray Street. So uh, there is, that will be a new pocket park will be created after construction of Brisbane Metro uh, is completed that will add green space uh, to the area. Now, in terms of how long we will be in uh, the Kurilpa Point area, uh, at the moment we expect to be in there from the 1st of May uh, this year until December uh, 2023. So, so, some significant time, um, uh, but we will be out of there, of course, earlier if we can. In terms of uh, the uh, suggestion for pop up parks, uh, Chair, look, it's not something that uh, we have done here in the city historically. Obviously, it's something that uh, our major project area can have a look at and I'm more than happy to consider, uh, but that would be, uh, I think, part of a wider uh, public policy change. We have to uh, remind uh, Councillor Shree that any cost that is added to these projects is inevitably borne by all ratepayers. So we want to do pop-up parks for residents in South Brisbane that uh, have some access to significant parklands and that will be borne by uh, all residents uh, within the city. So, but we're happy to have a look at that. I know it happens in other jurisdictions uh, where the parkland is treated essentially as, as a, uh, an asset that needs to be relocated so, uh, somewhere else. So uh, we will have a look at that and come back to you. Uh, in terms of the fish lane uh, detour, well, uh, we, we've had a really good look at this, Chair. We've had our engineers working on this for some time. Uh, there is simply no better uh, place to relocate the bikeway. Uh, we have interactions with the portal and the busway on Melbourne Street. Uh, and we also have to remember that Fish Lane is not, uh, it, it is a pedestrianised environment. It is quite friendly uh, to cyclists and pedestrians at the moment. The delivery vehicles that do go in there uh, are generally at quite a slow speed and are necessary to service uh, those restaurants uh, that are in there. And keep in mind, Councillor Shree, how hard those restaurants have been hit by years of uh, COVID lockdowns uh, and other, other issues uh, that have impacted them. Uh, so the last thing we really want to be doing is, uh, is changing uh, the times that they're able to take deliveries and make it harder for them. So uh, this is a balance. We will see how it works in operation in the first uh, few weeks and months. And if there are changes that need to be made, I'm more than happy to have a further Point conversation order, with you at that time. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Councillor, maybe take one more quick clarificatory question. Sure. Thanks. Murphy. Um, sorry, it's not on my side of the river, so I'm a little less familiar with it, but I understand as part of the, this work around the bridge, 
you're also closing off that access ramp from the Bicentennial Bikeway up to Victoria Bridge and up to North Quay. Um, so how then, how will cyclists who are coming along the Bicentennial Bikeway get up to the city or get over to the south side? Uh, I do have the answer to that question, but I will just take it on notice and maybe get back to Councillor Street okay. uh, later offline. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Murphy. We now move to the vote on the re Transport Committee report. All in, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Wines, Infrastructure Committee report, please. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 24th of May 2020 be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Wines and seconded by Councillor Maddock that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday 24 May 2022 be adopted. Councillor Wines. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, the report before us and the report before the committee last week was uh, one we had seen uh, before uh, where we give a regular update to committee members about the operation of the inner city transport network um, and the, an update on major projects which has a wide scope. So um, I trust that the uh, councillors present found it informative. Uh, the presenter provided a great deal of information on, on a whole range of things, both public uh, and private transport as well as state and council projects. Uh, interestingly, uh, some councillors and some residents may believe that inner city traffic is uh, getting up to where it was, but is still up to 5,000 vehicles a day on uh, George Street, for example, uh, less than it was before the pandemic uh, hit. So I think that um, I think that some behaviours, whether they, some behaviour changes happened, because as we know, uh, public transport is still a little bit down. Private uh, motor vehicles are still a little bit down, so uh, there's still a little way to go before we have full activation uh, of people back into the city for work and enjoyment. Can I also take a moment uh, as well on a portfolio matter? Can I also give a special recognition uh, to a Mr Graham Nell who has retired? Uh, and Graham worked with this council for 13 years. He retired as the manager of civil and transport, one of the, uh, one of the senior managers inside the city projects office. Uh, he was uh, a, a fundamental importance to uh, delivery of large projects in this city, uh, mm -hmm. which includes um, Gresham Street Bridge and, oh, excuse me, it took me a second to hear where the voice was from, yes. <laughs> um, you know, our Indrapilly Riverwalk, uh, the, last, the last major project that uh, he and I were working on together was, of course, the Mogul Road. Uh, upgrade. So um, he, he uh, and that was the last um, major project that he, the last major contract that he worked on before he retired. He was here with us for 13 years, starting out in bikeways. That is also where I first met him. Um, can I thank him for his service to our organisation and uh, and wish him all the best as he sets sail across um, across uh, Lake Eyre, he tells me, was, his, was, the, uh, was the objective. So I hope that he and his wife enjoy uh, the retirement that's well earned, and I recommend the report to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate? Further debate on the Infrastructure Committee report? I'll now put the report to the vote. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Allen, City Planning and Suburban Re Renewal Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 24th of May 2022, be adopted. Second that. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Hammond that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 24 May 2022, be adopted. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. In uh, last week's committee meeting, we had a, a really interesting uh, presentation on a, uh, a DA that's been approved recently for an adaptive reuse of a commercial building at 444 Queen Street. And uh, this building in particular was um, an interesting project in that the old building, which was a, a pretty horrible building, I might say, in terms of its uh, visual appeal. Um, sorry? It was ugly, Councillor Strunk, absolutely. Um, the, rather than demolish the whole building and rebuild again, they actually stripped away the old uh, shell, um, and used a lot of the existing uh, structure of the building to uh, bring about the, the new building, which is a very, very significant improvement on uh, what's currently on the site. So um, 
what they'll end up with once the, uh, the, the building is completed is a 24-storey tower. Um, the tower will have 21 storeys of leasable office space. There'll be uh, a ground level food and drink outlets and a, and a lobby. There's two levels of podium parking and there's also a rooftop garden. Now the, uh, the building itself is um, certainly more modern in appeal and uh, appearance than the previous building and it encompasses quite a significant amount of uh, greenery. And one of the key considerations uh, for the building was to ensure that it recognised and uh, was sympathetic to our subtropical climate and accordingly the design is very much um, focused on uh, light, uh, the movement of air, um, the greenery in the building, the, the streetscape, making sure that that's appealing and uh, has utility to the community and also ensuring that um, pedestrians on that section of Queen Street um, had protection from uh, the weather and accordingly there's quite a large awning there. The, the other key consideration is this building is actually adjoining a heritage site and uh, they've done a terrific job in terms of developing a podium that is very sympathetic to the adjoining heritage site. Um, while it is designed in a different way to the heritage building, the, the colours and the materials used are uh, consistent and so it doesn't, um, it, it's very complementary to the heritage site, it doesn't impose uh, over the heritage site and I think they've achieved a very good outcome there. Um, the other key assessment matters were around the, um, the refuse and uh, transport and they've done a great job with ensuring that they've got adequate parking particularly for, um, for active transport and end of trip facilities. The, um, one of the complexities, I guess, in the approval was there is a um, nearby residential tower and they wanted to ensure that uh, this particular tower didn't impact on the uh, amenity of that residential tower and certainly all of the reports and engineering reports that have been done there have ensured that uh, there is little or no impact to that adjoining residential tower. The, um, Key benefits from this building is that um, it is a five star green star rating. Um, there's a 44% reduction in carbon emissions from the building, which is equivalent to 3,700 cars uh, removed from the road annually. Um, the reuse of the structure um, has saved a very significant amount of potential carbon usage just by reusing the, uh, the existing uh, structure of the building and uh, the building has achieved a number of other uh, significant um, uh, environmental standards. The, uh, the reason that uh, the development services team approved this particular development was that it delivered something that um, was reflective of our subtropical climate. Uh, it was a great reuse of the uh, existing building. The architectural outcomes are first class and the the uh, building itself obviously provides for a level of uh, commercial accommodation in the city which will be uh, sought by uh, those in need of uh, A-class uh, commercial premises. And uh, I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. No, thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, any other debate? Councillor Johnston. Yes, just briefly on uh, item A. I'm still a little bit confused about what this um, actually is. Um, it doesn't strike me that this is an approval that's been undertaken by um, the committee. Um, there's no DA number listed in here. Um, there's no detail um, about whether or not um, the committee and or this council is approving anything. Um, I suspect it might be a minor change in paragraph three, um, sorry, in paragraph two, it talks about the height of the building increasing from 21 storeys to 24 storeys. But all in all, I'm a little bit confused about why this has come up to council. There's all these controversial DAs in the city where we're having material change of use um, outcomes um, radically impacting on residential communities, for example, and those aren't worthy of a mention um, in this council for debate. But as far as I know, this is not an approval for a DA. We're just getting a briefing on a building that's already approved. Um, 
and that's as far as it goes. I guess here's a few questions for the for the uh, for the chair. Um, can you tell us is this building going to be uh, solar powered? Uh, are there solar panels on the roof? Uh, two. Um, uh, is this builder going to harvest and uh, reuse or articulate um, rainwater and stormwater uh, to contribute to water efficiency in the building? Um, is there any on-site composting or any other waste um, management going on? Um, I note that, th that there's a whole several paragraphs, I think, about how wonderfully five-star green rated it is, but I'd like to know whether any of these practical measures are included in the design. And I'd also like to know is, is this a minor change? Is this just an update? Is this approval of a DA? Because it's very unclear on the papers before us. Any other debate? Councillor Allen, right of reply. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. In uh, response to uh, Councillor Johnston's questions, the, um, it's not unusual for the committee to have a presentation on a DA that's been approved, as is the case with this one. Um, we definitely uh, bring to the chamber um, committee present well, to the committee um, DAs that are you know, unique in nature. This one in particular was unique because of the adaptive reuse. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think we uh, had the Rivergate Marina approval um, come to committee in the chamber once again. Uh, uh, an interesting tourism and uh, tourism-related uh, approval. The um, the other points you made, I'm happy to take those on notice and get back to you, but uh, you know, it is an approval. It's a DA's been approved. I can give you the DA number if you want that. Um, the, uh, the, the application itself was really just a, a material change of use application. And uh, as I said, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I now put the committee report. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Davis, Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee. Uh, thank you, Acting Chair. Um, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting of Tuesday 24 May, uh, May 2022 be adopted. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Mackay, that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday 24 May 2022 be adopted. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Acting Chair. Tuesday's committee presentation was on the Brisbane Carbon Challenge and the work that has been undertaken with our champion households. The Brisbane Carbon Challenge was initiated to encourage and support Brisbane residents to reduce their emissions. And Council and Brisbane Sustainability Agency worked with 18 uh, champion households over 12 months to reduce their carbon emissions by 50%. In question time today, I spoke about the Green Heart Fair and how it was wonderful to have the opportunity to meet a number of the champion households uh, who participated in the challenge uh, and present completion certificates to them. And it was fantastic uh, to hear about the actions that they are now undertaking and how they found the challenge to be very rewarding on so many different levels. Uh, Mr Acting Chair, I'm delighted to report that over the year that the average reduction in household emissions was 55 per cent, which was a wonderful result and more than our original target of 50 per cent. The key outcome was that all households became significantly more conscious about their impact on the environment and how they could reduce that impact. As part of the Carbon Challenge, uh, Brisbane Sustainability Agency also la launched a carbon calculator, and the calculator enables all members of the public to calculate their household carbon emissions and receive general advice on the actions that can be taken to reduce their emissions and also to save bills. A feature of the online calculator is the ability for residents to log back in at any time, uh, to retake the calculator and to measure progress in reducing emissions. And I look forward to hearing more of the things um, that come out of the Carbon Challenge and how the program can encourage even more Brisbane residents to reduce their household emissions. Every small action really does make a difference. And I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Uh, any debate? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on item A. It would come as no surprise to anyone in this place that I am excited to talk about the Brisbane Carbon Challenge. This is an important element of the Schrinner Council commitment to pollution minimisation and carbon reduction. For the record, I'm going to remind the Chamber about why this carbon challenge is so important. 
Brisbane City Council is carbon neutral and we continue to advocate for carbon minimisation through different programs. As you would know, Acting Chair, Brisbane City Council became carbon neutral in 2017. I remember Lord Mayor Newman being passionate about carbon reduction. I remember Lord Mayor Quirk being proud of attaining the distinction of becoming carbon neutral. And I know how proud Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner is of continuing this and keeping us as the gold standard in the country. Brisbane City Council is, of course, Australia's largest carbon neutral government organisation, and it is critical to note that your council is the only certified organisation in the entire country with an operating landfill and a large public transport service. And that is important because Brisbane City Council is Australia's largest local government authority in terms of both population and budget. We know that Council achieved carbon neutral certification against the Climate Active Carbon Neutral Standard for Organisations in February 2018. That's when the paperwork was done, but the work started many years before that, because we're getting it done. We're not waving banners, we're not gluing ourselves to the road, we're getting it done. And the carbon challenge is another piece of the carbon reduction jigsaw puzzle. And let's talk about how this is getting done. Because activities such as the carbon challenge demonstrates Council's leadership in energy and carbon management in Australia. The Schrinner Council will continue to deliver cost-effective carbon reductions across business operations and encourage a reduction in the emissions from households. Not only will we work towards maintaining our carbon neutral commitment, the Schrinner Council is working towards reducing our community emissions. Our consumption and emissions start from the little things and stretch to world-class game-changing initiatives. The Brisbane Carbon Challenge involved highlighting some champion households and attempting to reduce their carbon emissions. Justice Council has upgraded 25,000 old-fashioned light bulbs into low-energy LED lights. Some of the Carbon Challenge homes also replaced old-fashioned globes and replaced them with efficient lighting. 78% of the Schrinner Council vehicles are low emission. We've heard at great length one of the Schrinner Council's greatest initiatives, the Metro, will have vehicles that are 100% electric. That means 100% zero tailpipe emissions. That means cleaner air, less pollution, better livability. While it was unlikely to expect any of the households participating in the carbon challenge to upgrade their vehicles to electric or low emission, we did see residents taking fewer rideshare trips, driving less, busing more and cycling when they could. And it's initiatives like that that have put Brisbane on the list as the 10th most livable city in the world. I'm sure you know that this council has installed 2,200 kilowatts of solar panels on council assets. That includes libraries, facilities and bus depots. Again, while households participating in the challenge wouldn't have been expected to install solar panels, Council's many coming. opted to switch Please. to the use of clean green renewable energy. Further, we're reducing our emissions by reducing green waste going into landfill. In fact, this council has reduced such landfill by 40%, which helps re reduce emissions. We're also diverting organic Councillor waste- Councillor Cumming, please stop interrupting. Just sounds Councillor like a McCoy. mosquito. Oh. Um, we're also diverting organic waste with composting hubs at 23 locations across the city, including St Lucia. Don't forget the food waste recycling pilot program too, because the households participating in the Brisbane Carbon Challenge also rose to the challenge of food waste reduction and reduced their carbon emissions by not sending food to food waste to landfill. I'm sure you know, Acting Chair, that Sherwood Bus Depot in Tennyson uh, was awarded five Green Star ratings for the environmentally friendly sustainable design. Please Gee, continue, Councillor McCoy. I'm so thrilled to be able to be corrected all the time. It's great. Elements include... I shouldn't use sarcasm. It doesn't read well in Hansard, does it? I don't appreciate the snide comments, is what I should say. Elements including solar panels, rainwater storage, stormwater harvesting and bioretention basins were installed to achieve five-star green ratings. Some of the champion households in the Carbon Challenge used energy monitors to try to reduce their energy on a domestic scale, the way Council does on an industrial scale. Chair, Acting Chair, we cannot, of course, realistically make our emissions a flat zero in the near future. 
I suggest that as long as we have landfills and without sig significant changes to the scientific processes, this would not be possible. And that is why other action is required. That is why the Schrinner Council rolls out different programs, including the Brisbane Carbon Challenge, to help reduce emissions across the city. If memory serves me correctly, the average Brisbane household emits about 12 tonnes of carbon every year, and the Carbon Challenge aims to reduce that to six tonnes per household per year. Residents of Brisbane should be proud of the Schrinner Council's effort and its direct action on carbon emissions. Maybe everyone else can try to catch up. Further debate? Yep. Councillor Johnston. Yes, just um, uh, through you, Mr uh, Deputy Chair, just a quick question. Um, I note that there are 18 households that participated in this glorious program that we're discussing here today. 18. 18. 18. So, you know, I think there's sort of 800,000 households in Brisbane, so I'm glad there were 18. Um, but well, I think clearly somebody, Councillor Mackay, knows, but that's great. I, I'm glad he knows because he's obviously got some sort of information that the rest of us don't have. Um, so I'd, uh, I'd, through you, Mr Deputy Chair, just like to know um, which suburbs uh, have the 18 um, participants in this program. I'd just like to know what the suburbs are, please. And if there's more than one per suburb, then that would also be useful to know. Thank you. Uh, further debate? Uh, thank Councillor you, Davis, Acting Chair. And, um, I don't have that information uh, here with me, but I'm happy to get that information for you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, what I would say is that this was quite an intensive program where officers were working very, very closely with the champion households to assist them uh, through, the, through the program. Uh, we called for nominations for people to participate in the program, and what the team looked for were different types of households, so families, young families, uh, renters, share house um, uh, residents. So I was trying to get a range of different people to participate. So it wasn't based on where they lived, it was the type of household uh, in which they lived. Uh, so uh, to suggest for one moment that somehow these were predetermined locations for households to participate is frankly offensive. It is untrue, uh, but I will, Councillor Johnston, uh, as you requested, provide those suburbs for you. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. Uh, the, the chair's given her report, so Councillor Johnston, your claim. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, at no time did I imply that somehow uh, there'd been some wrongdoing or misrepresentation here. I asked for a list of the suburbs, uh, and I appreciate that Councillor Davis will supply that. Uh, I now put the committee report. All those in favour say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Toomey, City Standards Committee. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the City Standards Committee held Tuesday, the 24th of May, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Toomey, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 24 May, 2022, be adopted. Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Before I move into last week's uh, committee report, uh, I did attend the Brisbane Pool Spa and Lifestyle Expo uh, where we actually had uh, built environment, I had a stall there, uh, and officers were maintaining that stall during uh, that expo. I particularly want to give a shout out to Andrew and Natalie, who were the officers that I joined on Sunday. Um, they took me through a wide range of uh, compliance issues around pool fencing, gates, uh, and, and the like. It was interesting to know uh, there was a lot of things that I didn't actually know about pool fencing, and I'm quite sure that there'd be a lot of residents in Brisbane that don't know about pool fencing as well. And what pleased me to no end was both Natalie and Andrew uh, were all over their, their stuff. They just knew it end to end. Uh, I really want to thank them for the work that uh, Natalie, Andrew and the other officers did over the weekend at their pool and spa expo. Uh, they fielded some 120 inquiries, Mr Deputy Chair. Uh, a lot of them 
uh, from what I gathered, were around spas uh, and whether fencing was required for a, a spa. Um, all of this information is, is quite critical uh, to our residents when it comes to keeping young children safe around open bodies of water. And I really want to pass uh, my appreciation on to uh, Andrew, Natalie, and the rest of the officers that maintain the stall um, over the weekend. Uh, we had a couple of questions in today's committee, uh, Mr Deputy Chair from Councillor Cumming, and I'm quite happy to provide answers here in the report. Uh, Councillor Cumming asked uh, which uh, schools and child cares uh, within his area uh, are part of the Lord Mayor's Environmental Leadership Network, uh, and that is Iona College, uh, Councillor Cumming, and also Wyndham State High School. Uh, he also asked a question around the Waste Smart Kindies, uh, and I'm pleased to say that children at the Bay Terrace uh, are part of that scheme. Uh, we also learnt today in the, in the committee report that uh, Councillor uh, Johnson has a very, very good um, kindy in her area that, that's also um, worth noting that's, that's doing really, really good stuff. Uh, for other councillors who want to know uh, the schools and kindies that are participating, sorry, forgive me, the schools and kindies that are participating in the program, that information is available on council's website. Uh, Mr Chair, last year's committee presentation was on asbestos and uh, Paula, our compliance and regulatory service, services presenter, uh, gave us information that council has attended uh, or investigated, I should say, over 1,800 investigations uh, since 2015 and 16 relating to um, asbestos. Some 890 were followed through by our compliance team, uh, and then obviously there was a number that were issued um, monetary pins. Uh, the information presented by Paula, um, I got the impression from the committee, was, was quite good. Uh, and there were plenty of questions being fielded from the committee towards the presenter. Uh, with that, I'll leave the rest of debate to the chamber. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Uh, is there any debate? No debate. Uh, I'll put the committee report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Howard, Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 24th of May 2022 be adopted. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 24th of May 2022 be adopted. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. And just before moving to the report, as usual, I want to um, update the Chamber on all of the fantastic things that have been happening around Brisbane in the last week. Um, we've talked about the Green Heart Fair, and it truly was magnificent um, in your board, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, I took great delight in taking my granddaughter along and she had a fantastic time and I know that there were a lot of families there, as Councillor Davis said, but uh, I really want to say a big thank you to all of those involved in making it such a fantastic event. And of course the weather was magnificent and it was equally magnificent the day before when we had the Tenerife Festival. Again, this is one of the best suburban festivals in Brisbane and I know I'm slightly biased, but um, it was just fantastic to see so many people there. This year we had a street dedicated to the children's area and we had um, the New Farm State School children performing um, a number of times during the day and it was really fantastic again to see all of the, um, the families coming along to that wonderful Tenery Festival and of course uh, for the nighttime economy, and I know that Council Cumming is always interested in knowing what's happening at the nighttime economy. Um, the nighttime economy at the Tenerife Festival was stupendous. Uh, wonderful acts, uh, lots of people who were um, coming into the uh, to the festival and really enjoying that early evening at the Tenerife Festival. Um, also last week I attended on behalf of the Lord Mayor the Big Reach, which was a mental health workshop where um, there was discussion around how 
creative um, activities can support those with mental health issues. And again, really want to thank the organisers for taking the time to involve so many of our local artists and our local organisations to come together so that they could talk about some of the latest um, uh, things that are happening within that particular sector. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to Ben Bajansen for uh, Light Up the Night. It was a charity gala. It's for um, a fight against LGBTIQ domestic violence. And it was the first time that this has been held. The Lady Mayoress and the Lord Mayor were, were there uh, supporting um, Ben and his team. We had um, Dame Quentin Bryce. It was, uh, again, um, a wonderful inaugural event. And it was something that I think uh, that all of those who were there could um, really enjoyed and for such a good cause and to hear Dame Quentin talk about um, the, 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 great, um, the great steps forward that have been taken in all forms of domestic violence but the LGBTQI community particularly has faced some of those in the past. And so really want to thank Ben and his team for uh, taking that big step of having their very first uh, gala and really congratulate them on Light Up the Night. Uh, moving to the committee, we had a committee presentation on children's early literacy and reading programs update. And, uh, it was wonderful to hear about the many, many programs that we have um, from babies all the way through uh, toddler time, story time. We talked about uh, some of our Indigenous programs and it really was uh, a, um, a special presentation. And uh, I'd just like to, I think it's important that the Chamber knows that one of the questions that was asked was, uh, what was our earliest memory of, of a book? So I'd like to share with you that Councillor Toomey's was Biggles, uh, that Councillor Griffiths was Storm Boy, Councillor Cummings, Billy Bunting, and then the famous five was the overall winner with Councillor Landers, Councillor Mackay and myself having those strong memories. Sorry, it pointed out is Billy Bunter. Billy Bunter. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor. I will take that interjection and please make sure it's Clark so that we get the right name in the... <laughs> <laughs> the thing. Um, it was a really great presentation. Uh, I really want to let the Chamber know that uh, our committee uh, really does sort of um, look at some of the wonderful things that Council does right across Brisbane and our libraries I think are just so special and uh, to have that uh, contribution from all of our committee members that day was really extra special and I'll leave debate to the Chamber. Thank you Councillor Howard. Uh, any debate? Thank you, Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on item A also, children's early literacy and reading programs. Um, as a young mum, I cannot thank Council enough for the lengths they go to to support our youngest residents. As Councillor Howard mentioned, some of these programs include First Five Forever, Little Stars Reading Program and the Mobile Library, which visits our local events. These events are not only a ton of fun, a great social outing for parents and bubs, but also have a lasting impact for our children. A few years ago, I visited a book tour by Mem Fox. Many of us know her as the author of Possum Magic or Where, the Green, Where is the Green Sheep. However, I went and listened to her speak about her book for parents, Reading Magic. She spoke about a number of lifelong benefits about reading out loud to children has. But a few points that stuck with me are bonding, brain development, and the benefits of reading for their future. She spoke about the importance of getting down on the ground and laughing with your child playing with them, reading with them, showing them how much you love them. I remember her saying, who cares if they rip the pages? That's what they're for, just tape it up or get them a cardboard book. She also spoke about children's brains development and expressed how important the first five years of your child's life is and the most important for their brain development. Our brains are a massive muscle full of uh, motor neurons and by reading aloud to them, it helps children's brains build and form these neuron connections. On the first Five Forever website, it says, in the first five years of your child's life, their brain forms over a million new connections every second. It's incredible. Research shows the first five years last a lifetime and that simple everyday activity of reading with our child makes these connections strong. And Mam's last point that I remember uh, speaking about a lot was reading out aloud. As a result of hearing different words, they will have 
um, learnt so many different words themselves and how to use them. I know we all have those moments as parents when our children start to say big words. Recently, my Georgia four-year-old said, that's extraordinary, mum, and it melted my heart and gave me a little giggle. But there are so many statistics and case studies from a number of Australian universities showing how important it is to develop our child's brain. Some of the cool ones I learnt today was, um, if your child cannot rhyme by the time they are four, they're going to find it really hard to read later in life. The other one was, if a child can recite six rhymes by the time they're four, they always are at the top of their reading group by the time they're eight. So reading and singing to our children have lifelong benefits, and I cannot thank Council enough for their efforts in giving our youngest residents the best possible start with their amazing programs. Thank you. Further debate? Councillor Howe? Um, I'll now put the committee report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cunningham, Finance and City Governance Committee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 24th of May 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 24th of May 2022, be adopted. Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Deputy Chair. Our committee presentation last week was on the Commitment to Council program. This is a human resources initiative which recognises the service and dedication of our council staff. As councillors would know from their interactions, we are blessed to have so many staff who dedicate their professional careers to the service of the people of, to the people of Brisbane, and I'd like to take this opportunity to once again acknowledge and thank them. Long-term staff retention is important to Council, and we want to recognise those long-serving staff for their commitment. The Lord Mayor's Commitment to Council program acknowledges and celebrates the careers of employees who have dedicated 10 or more years to Council. The program recognises staff through celebratory events and recognition on internal comms channels as well. Staff who have worked at Council for more than 35 years are also recognised at a special ceremony. Last year, we recognised 347 employees for 10 years of service, 276 employees for 15 years of service, 117 employees for 20 years of service, 75 employees for 25 years, 53 for 30 years, and 75 employees for more than 35 years worth of service to Council. So we thank them, and we thank them for, especially for their service to the people of Brisbane. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Deputy Chair, we also had our usual financial report for receivable rates, inventory, payables, provisions, and malls for the period ended March 2022. And I'll leave the rest to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Uh, any debate? No debate. I'll put the committee report. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Petitions, councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I have a petition uh, uh, that's been received requesting council implement traffic calming measures on Kent and Lodge roads in Kalinga. Thank you. Councillor Johnston. Yes, I have a petition from residents of Chelmar calling on Council to rehabilitate and resurface Gordon Thompson Park. Thank you. No other petitions? Council Landers, may I have a motion for receipt of the petitions? Yes, Chair. I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Second. Thank you. As moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Strunk that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee's concern for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? No. Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to speak tonight in regards to some local community events um, right across the city of Brisbane. Um, Mr Deputy Chair, I'd like to make a reflection on the unveiling of the Indigenous Memorial to acknowledge um, those 
who have served and continue to serve in our Defence Forces. Um, Friday was a very um, important event and as the Lord Mayor said, it was a once in a lifetime event and it was held on sacred ground and it was made even more sacred by the unveiling of that memorial on Friday. One very important component of, of that gathering and there were quite a number of people who were there, was that it was the largest gathering of current and former Indigenous serving officers of the Defence Services ever. And to bring them all together and to see them sharing their pride in their culture and their background but also their pride in serving our nation was very, very significant. I also had the privilege of representing the Lord Mayor um, the following day at the first formal wreath laying service, which um, has been a long time um, in coming in the sense that there has been wreath laying in the past, but never before with a memorial in Anzac Square. So going forward, this will have even more significance um, for particularly those serving officers and whether they are current or former. And it was great to see that people had come from far and wide to be there for that unveiling. I'd also like to mention, Mr Deputy Chair, the Korean Taekwondo Association of Queensland on Saturday morning, they had their championships at Nissan Arena. And to see many of these young people and the way that they are focused and disciplined on going through their different stages and their different belts uh, for Taekwondo, there is a lot of commitment. And these are very, very young children, many of them. And I was speaking to one young lady and she said, this is my first tournament championships and I'm really, really nervous. But she said, I'm really, really proud to be here. And to hear that sense of pride and that level of achievement was really great to know that those young people are really grasping the opportunity to, to take that next step. Mr Deputy Chair, I'd also like to acknowledge the 75 years of our UN peacekeepers from our Australian forces. On Saturday morning, um, I had the privilege as well of attending the wreath laying ceremony. Now, I haven't um, missed one um, since they've been held and since I was first elected. And it was really interesting to see how it's evolving and I do acknowledge the, president, the presence of Her Excellency the Governor of Queensland, Dr Jeanette Young, at that ceremony as well because her presence made a major statement for all of the peacekeepers. It really, on the 75th year anniversary of them being formed, it really spoke volumes. It's interesting to see the support that is garnered at these peacekeeping ceremonies, um, wreath laying ceremonies, because we have everybody from um, the Consular Corps to the Cypriot Patriot Societies to the Rwandans who are holding up photos saying we thank Australia for, for looking after us. And also to two of my constituents, two young ladies who sang the national anthem who actually hold the world record for singing the most national anthems, 195 national anthems in 100 languages. They sang them all back to back in September 2021. And they are young ladies who live in Calumvale, who've grown up in my area, and they originally came from Kerala in, in India. So they weren't content to just sing a national anthem and convert it to Malayalam or Hindi. They, they went through every single of the 195 anthems and learnt them in 100 languages. And their presence there because they have always been focused on promoting peace and that was their aim by learning all of those national anthems in all of those 
natural languages to promote the concept of peace across the world by bringing all of those anthems together. But can I say to all of those who have served and continue to serve as peacekeepers right across the world, thank you for your service because your job is a difficult one and it is something that is ongoing and very vital. I'd also just like to make mention of the Australian Institute of Architects um, Brisbane Awards that were held on Saturday night and it was a pleasure to be able to present the Brisbane City Council sponsored award for the Buildings That Breathe to Fender Katsalidis and they are a Brisbane uh, based architecture firm and they were extremely proud and can I say that from the judging of that award. There were so many contenders, but this particular one really exemplified the criteria that we as a council endeavour to promote. So they've done a fantastic job, and uh, I say congratulations not only to them, but to all businesses that were nominated and to all of those who received commendation on, on the evening. Um, this weekend uh, and this week are going to see some uh, significant milestones as well. Um, on the 2nd of June we will have the 10 year um, anniversary of the opening of Wisdom College in my area and this is a major milestone for this very young school and they are going ahead in leaps and bounds providing important opportunities for our local youth. On the 4th of June, we'll also see the celebration of the Eid Mellor um, hosted by ISQ and also the party in the park with Belong. So they're regular events that in the past we've managed to celebrate and it's been a long time with all the COVID interruptions, but it's great to have these festivals back and happening again. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't focus on um, Sunday morning, the 5th of June, the Dragon Boat Festival, which I um, assisted the Hucker Association to establish, and that will be held once again. It is a proud event that council sponsors, and I know many councillors do attend that event. The Hucker Association, year on year on year, continues to work extremely hard to put on this wonderful event to bring people in the community together to celebrate the cultural diversity and also to promote an active and healthy lifestyle in our city. So there's certainly lots of events that are hitting the ground at the moment and it's wonderful to make sure that we can be out there to support them. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Further general business, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, I rose to speak about um, a number of uh, events uh, that happened over the weekend. Um, but want to uh, start off by, I was sad that Councillor Howard's just left the chamber uh, because I, um, I would have liked to have uh, put my, uh, my earliest memory or my favourite book in my earliest memory was uh, The Little Engine That Could uh, by Matty Piper and, uh, in kindy. And uh, I, still remember, I still remember a lot of the words out of that, which is really interesting. But anyways, I just want to put that on record. Um, now, in regards to events, um, we had an opening of a, a new uh, childcare in kindy called uh, Happy Hearts um, on, uh, on Saturday. And I just want to compliment uh, Haley and her team, the manager and her team, um, who have um, opened up a center that actually is really quite spectacular, actually, um, in, a, in, a, um, in a suburban street uh, behind uh, Richland Sea State School. Um, and uh, it's just amazing what these, the state of these childcare centres are now and how inviting they are for the kids and for the parents. Um, this particular centre um, has, um, has a good drop-off area within the precinct because uh, it was a good-sized block and they, did, they uh, made great use of the space, um, having a, a good drop-off area, so, uh, which is uh, safe uh, because, again, it's in a suburban street. Uh, that runs behind the uh, Richland Sea State School. And uh, it was an interesting background uh, as well uh, of the family, a family who um, built the uh, childcare centre. This is their fifth 
Uh, they have one up at Caboolture and a number of others uh, around uh, Southeast Queensland as well. And they only started doing this uh, when they immigrated from South Africa in 2017. So they've really done a great job uh, in establishing some wonderful centers right uh, here in Brisbane and uh, in other area, in other jurisdictions as well. So I just want to compliment on them, them on that. It's, uh, and of course with the, uh, with the uh, promise of, uh, uh, of more childcare money for uh, families um, from the new uh, Albanese government, uh, we are certainly going to need more childcare centers to uh, help those families who uh, need to uh, put their child in care while they go out to work to pay for, uh, pay for their uh, homes and, uh, and living. Um, we have the, uh, the Vietnamese chapter uh, again, uh, and I've raised and I've, I've talked about this, the chapter in regards to the fundraising they're doing. Well, they've contempt, they continue that on, um, and uh, this last uh, Saturday they were raising more money for the uh, for the flood victims, uh, Brisbane flood victims as well, uh, not just Brisbane but Ipswich as well, flood victims, and also the uh, Ukrainian refugees as well. Um, they have raised um, currently, and, and this didn't include this last Saturday. They had raised fifty-one thousand dollars for the flood victims, and uh, and twenty-six thousand dollars for the Ukrainian refugees. So, uh, uh, Senator Scarf and uh, Milton Dick, uh, the member for uh, Oxley, were there in attendance as well. And um, it was uh, it was again, it's something that they have been doing now. This is now the third fundraiser, and they're preparing to do a fourth as well. So I just want to. Um, Dr. Bowie and the chapter is, uh, does an amazing job in this area. Now, uh, on Saturday as well, we have the Bangladeshi Association's um, um, Bengali uh, New Year, um, and it was supposed to take place up at uh, the, remain, or the domain up in Ipswich, but unfortunately with the, all the rain that we've had over the last week or so, um, that wasn't able to be accommodated, and they had to relocate within two days of the decision being made and get everything to another venue. Well, the Islamic co College at Durak put their hand up and the Imam said, yep, we're up for it. And uh, within two days, they had everything uh, rearranged. And that would not have been an easy thing because this was a big, this was a big festival. Um, they had multiple, multiple stalls out in the commons area, plus of course all the entertainment inside in the auditorium. Um, I, I just want to compliment, of course, uh, 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 Dr. JD, um, who is there, um, he, was the, he was the MC actually on the, on the night, um, but he, uh, he's one of the spokespeople for the association. Um, they, do, they do terrific uh, work. Uh, on, a, on a number of other programs as well, but this was uh, something they just could not put off because COVID, of course, had disrupted their, uh, their festivals uh, or their, their uh, New Year's uh, in the past, and they, they weren't gonna let uh, some rain this time uh, disrupt it any, any longer. So they found the new venue within two days and moved everything over there and in, and it was just quite amazing uh, that they were able to do that. Uh, fan fantastic food, pop-up stalls, as I said, and a, and a lot of dancing, and uh, it was really a, a great night, enjoyed by everyone. Um, and of course, as Councillor Owen said, the Dragon Boats uh, are uh, this Sunday, the 5th, uh, and um, we're, uh, Council officers are preparing the uh, site. Um, now, we, 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 had, uh, we had a lot of rain, of course, which uh, disrupted some of the harvesting of some of the, some of the weed, um, whether it be the savinia or the cutting of the uh, existing uh, uh, plant life that sort of grows up to the surface that has to be trimmed down to around about 18 inches uh, or about 450 mil um, uh, every so often as it, as it grows up. So um, to make up for the fact that we didn't, uh, we weren't able to get in there as quickly and as long as we uh, possibly could, uh, we've got two harvesters in at the moment. We got a medium size, we got the small one. The small one's doing the savinia, and the medium size is doing the, uh, the, uh, the uh, plant, the plant uh, material that sort of grows to the surface. I, I don't want to call it weed because I don't think it's a weed. It's really just the plant life that grows up that needs to absorb the nutrients in the lake. 
Um, but uh, all that's happening, and um, uh, the, as I say, the site's being prepared um, with the litter cleanup as well. Um, so it should be a really, providing we have good weather, and it looks like Baum is uh, predicting that, we should have a really good day there on Sunday with many, many thousands of people that, uh, that attend that uh, event. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Strunk. Further general business, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Acting Chair. Um, I rise briefly to speak about the Lenham Fair, which is happening this Saturday at Lenham Park. It's traditionally called the Lenham May Fair, but unfortunately everyone would appreciate why we dropped the May, because um, it was a little damp on that day. Um, it'd be, I have to acknowledge Rot Inner North Rotary, because without Inner North Rotary, this fair would not happen. They do get the council festival funding and also it's topped up by the Marchant Ward office to, have, to give the residents of the Marchant Ward, Inaugural Ward and McDowell Ward a free family fun day. So what can you expect this Saturday? Well, you'll be disappointed that the Little Movers, one of our local dance um, schools, uh, have cancelled. Um, due to all the little movers having a birthday celebration um, and they've gone off to celebrate the little movers' birthday. But we do have the Franciscans on the Hill rock band. That is Padua and Mount Alvernia rock band. These kids are so talented. They're equal to the paid performers that we have on the day. Um, it gives these children or young adults, I should say, the opportunity to actually perform um, in you know, a professional environment <coughs> in front of large crowds. Um, all the food around the event is all done by our local community group because the reason why we hold this event is to build our communities and build them we do. It's lovely to walk around and see everyone going, you know, what street do you live in? Oh, nice to see you, I haven't seen you for a while. Comment on someone's dog. All the community groups just getting together um, and raising money for their different organisations. So what is free? The rock climbing wall, the pony rides, the petting zoo, the face painting, the jumping castle, um, and of course, the professional entertainment on the stage. Again, I would like to thank my staff, um, Elizabeth, who looks after that in the Marchant Ward office, and the one that Councillor Wines just stole from me, Monica. Um, thank you for all your hard work too, Monica, because you really started it off um, before you were poached by Council Wines. Not that I'm a little bit upset by that at all, um, but I will catch up with Monica again on Monday. So please feel free to come down to see the professional entertainment, have your face painted or just a little bit of glitter put on your face, do the rock climbing wall and eat a snag or two. Lanham Park, Grange. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Uh, further general business? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I, uh, I rise to uh, speak about uh, Gresham Street Bridge. Um, Deputy Chair, we've heard a little bit from the Lord Mayor and Councillor Wines uh, today about Gresham Street Bridge, uh, but just to put a bit of background behind this bridge, um, this was, as far as we know, Brisbane's last timber bridge that serviced vehicle traffic. Uh, the bridge also carried a gas main and a water main uh, into St John's Wood. Now, to put that into context uh, with the recent events that happened in February, uh, should the old bridge have been in place, it would have been almost two metres underwater. Two metres, that's, that's a little bit taller than me. Uh, the bridge itself, the old bridge, is protecting a sewer main and we've had commitment from UU that they will be uh, upgrading that sewer main and armouring that sewer main in its current position because it's gravity fed, the location of the sewer main can't be changed. Um, but to say that this has been uh, a long project, it has. Uh, this project technically started two years ago with the removal of the gas main off Gresham Street Bridge and then dug underneath Inogra Creek. Uh, then we took the water main off the bridge and we also put that underneath 
Anogra Creek. Now, the wonderful thing about putting a gas main under a creek and a water main under a creek is that they can no longer be broken by tree strikes or that kind of uh, event. So that secures the services going into St John's Wood for gas and water. Another part of the project, Mr Deputy Chair, was relocating the 33 kilovolt power line that goes through uh, from Waterworks Road into, into the woods. And that was primarily initially done for uh, the removal of the old bridge. Uh, as the chamber would probably appreciate, cranes, swinging cranes with large arms and power lines really don't mix. So the, the whole power line was moved away from the demolition area for the bridge. Um, this has actually had the added benefit of creating more space to revegetate on either side of the bridge. So once the, um, once the landscaping works kick off, we're going to have a beautiful landscaped area on either side of the new bridge. The other thing that was done as part of this project, Mr Deputy Chair, was we actually lifted the bridge. So the decking of the bridge is now one and a half metres above the old decking. Now this has a couple of advantages. It increases the flood immunity up for the bridge. So people of St John's Wood and also Bennett's Road uh, can get out in an event because Bennett's Road crossing generally goes under well before Gresham Street Bridge does. They can access and get out in an event. The other thing is, is there is some localised flooding that we generally see through Royal Parade. And by widening the creek underneath Gresham Street Bridge, uh, we're allowing that water from Royal Parade to escape away a lot more quickly because we're actually lifting the height that the pipe egresses into the creek. So that's another advantage. Another great part of this project, Mr Deputy Chair, and one that I am uh, really very proud of, and uh, as Councillor Wine said, Graham Nell um, is retiring. Graham uh, does need to take credit for this. This was something that he did on very short notice, and that was to enable the redesign of the bridge for buses to turn left off Waterworks Road to access uh, the terminus in St John's Wood. Now, the terminus, Mr Deputy Chair, has capacity for three buses, um, but there, are only, there is only one bus service that actually services St John's Wood, and that's the 379. But this allows the terminus to be used for uh, buses that would service west of St John's Wood, so through to the Gap, uh, and in some cases, Capera and... Um, what's the shopping centre out your way, Councillor Wines? Brookside, thank you. Uh, to service that area as well. So this is a fantastic outcome um, for, for my community and also Councillor Wines' community, which connects it back into the Gap Village. The bridge itself is concrete and steel. Uh, when you look at it, it's going to take a nuclear strike to get rid of it now, because she's a solid bridge. She's not going anywhere. Uh, and in the recent flood events, it proved hands down that uh, the piers, there's only two piers in the creek now. There was, uh, was a four or five previously, Council Wines? It was four, wasn't it? It was quite a number. And one of those piers, Mr Deputy Chair, was timber. So there was a composite between concrete piers and timber piers going into this creek. And putting it into context, this bridge was taking rubbish trucks and buses and it held up for 90 years with a, with a timber pier. Uh, so it did really well for the, for the life cycle of the bridge. It did fantastic. Uh, but it's, go it's going to be a bridge that's going to service the St John's Wood area for a very, very long time to come. Um, I want to thank the Lord Mayor uh, for bringing the construction of the bridge forward. I want to thank Graham Nell for the work that he did in the design of the bridge and enabling us to have uh, left turns and right turns from Waterworks Road with buses onto the bridge. I also want to thank Graham, and this is one thing that I didn't mention, Councillor Wines, was the reinforcing of the pedestrian edges. So if we do need to widen the bridge, we've got extra capacity there to do that. Uh, the bridge has got improved pedestrian access. Uh, we have uh, three childcares in the area, two schools, 
and a small business district. So it's highly, uh, highly, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Activated area. Uh, so it's, going, it, it's a fantastic outcome. Um, but one thing I do, I, I really want to um, acknowledge the actual project manager. So I know the Lord Mayor sort of threw the project manager job at me, but uh, no, I'd, I'd really like to acknowledge the work that, that NAB did on this project. Uh, he's been with the project for the full two years, uh, from beginning to, to end. Uh, and during that time, he did, uh, he did bring on a second child. So when you think about, uh, about the work that NAB's done, he's built a bridge and had a baby all in the last two years, uh, and he survived. I should really get him the T-shirt. Um, he's done a fantastic job, and I want to thank him uh, for his interaction uh, with the community, uh, because the community were well aware of what's going on, the communications that came out about the project the timeframes and everything was just absolutely outstanding. Uh, and NAB's uh, discussions with me about the progress of the bridge as well, uh, I really want to compliment NAB on the work he has done. And uh, I wish him well on his next project and hopefully uh, it'll be in the Gap Ward. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Toomey. Uh, further general business? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on matters relating to National Reconciliation Week and in particular the Noonga Reconciliation event which are held in Kalinga Park every year and unfortunately not this year due to uh, the damage to Kalinga Park during the recent flood events. Um, for councillors, I know Councillor Cassidy is well aware of uh, the Noonga Reconciliation Group. We've been there together in the past uh, but for Others who may, may not be aware of them, they're a, a volunteer organisation made up of uh, dedicated community members from the whole North Brisbane area, committed to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples through developing friendships, cultural understanding and shared experiences, working with local elders, schools in particular, which is great to see as the schools have come to this event in increasing numbers over recent years, and the broader community to create opportunities for cultural learning and reconciliation. So a, a wonderful group. Um, the Secretary is Colleen Kelly, who I think a lot of people in this yeah, place yeah. would know, uh, and the, uh, the President is uh, a wonderful lady by the name of Maura Bly. Unfortunately, um, the event didn't proceed this year in, uh, in Reconciliation Week due to the, uh, the park uh, damage following the floods. Um, whilst there's been a clean-up of, of debris down in Kalinga Park, the ground is still like a, a sponge and access down to the area where the, uh, the um, group had their special ceremonial place. Uh, it was too uh, damaged, they said, and they decided not to proceed with the uh, commemoration. But um, I, I wanted to draw to the attention um, of the councillors an issue there. When, when I went down to see the damage there caused by the flood, um, and a lot of people will understand that this was a significant flood event that uh, cascaded down through Kedron Brook and caused uh, a considerable amount of damage. That's nature at work. But when I was down there inspecting the damage, I was horrified to see a deliberate and malicious act of uh, damage to the journey home sign there at the Noongar Reconciliation Place. And it's horrifying. You can you see mindless graffiti occasionally on signs where people scrawl bits and pieces all over the sign. But this was a deliberate and malicious act to scratch out on the sign, sorry day, national sorry day scratched out. Um, the words um, stolen generation scratched out throughout the, the whole, pl on, on the plaque. Uh, and w it was just a, a, a crying shame to see that. Uh, Councillor Howard talked earlier about in reconciliation week the need to get hearts, minds and action together and I would contend also we need soul. Um, that there are grubs like this out in the community who are prepared to undertake an act of deliberate and malicious uh, damage to a sign like this is uh, hurtful uh, and, and hurtful not just to me but I'm sure to the whole community. I'm pleased to, see, to say and to see that the sign has been replaced. Uh, it was done quick smart when it was brought to the attention of the sign shop. So congratulations to Brisbane Sign Shop for quickly uh, engineering the, the, the fix of the sign so it's now in place. Regret, and it was in 
place in time for the conduct of the ceremony if the group had decided to proceed with it, but unfortunately due to the conditions of the ground they decided not to proceed. But um, how, how dreadful it is that there are people out there who are prepared to undertake this sort of deliberate malicious uh, damage to a sign. Uh, but I'm pleased to see that we have a, a reconciliation plan. I know that we're on board with these actions and uh, uh, these sorts of locations in Kalinga Park recognising what was the hurt that was uh, committed during those times, the, the stolen generation times, uh, are important for us all to recognise and I'm pleased to, to say that we do work with uh, groups like the Noonga Reconciliation Group to effect change in our community. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, any further general business? Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, just on a quick matter of general business related to the flood recovery effort in our um, parks, particularly our playgrounds. I want to put on the, concern, on the record my strongest possible concern about the failure of Brisbane City Council to properly clean up remediate and uh, to restore uh, 12 playgrounds in Tennyson Ward. Um, for some weeks now, we've been receiving updates as councillors from our um, parks officers about the status of our parks. Um, there are 11 parks in Tennyson Ward that have been open uh, and the playgrounds within those parks have been open um, but no proper clean-up of the softball and uh, the um, rubber matting has been undertaken. One of the uh, 12 parks has had softball put in over the top of the existing flooded softball uh, and it's been open the whole time since as well. The reason I'm concerned is there are two wastewater treatment plants in Tennyson Ward, one at Oxley and one at Fairfield. Uh, these wastewater treatment plants unfortunately get flooded. When the wastewater treatment plants flood, the sewerage spreads out all over Tennyson Ward and unfortunately uh, it causes really significant problems in our parks. And as a result, there have been 12 contaminated playgrounds, uh, many of which will have had sewerage infested floodwaters through them. This council has not properly cleaned up these parks. They have been open for weeks. I've been raising this issue with council officers for weeks and with councillor Marks and more recently since he took over councillor Toomey. Uh, I'm extremely concerned because last week in uh, several of these parks, council went and put a veneer of uh, really fine, I'd have to describe it as sawdust, over the top of um, the existed uh, softball areas of the 12 or 11 playgrounds that I'm talking about. Um, this is absolutely unacceptable. Um, having gone through this before, I know that council had to dig out these areas. Um, bacteria breeds in uh, the underfall areas. Um, it's a moist, hot. Um, it's a moist, hot environment. Um, it's never properly dried out. We've uh, had wet areas in these parks for months since the floods. Uh, they. I am extremely concerned that Council has not properly remediated uh, these uh, 12 uh, playgrounds. The only thing that has happened in them is they got hosed off. So this is what amounts to flood recovery in Tennyson Ward in children's playgrounds. They get pressure washed. Um, now it is a matter of urgency that this Council properly remediates uh, our playgrounds so that children using them uh, can do so and families can be assured that they are clean and safe. That's clearly not the case. Now, in, after 2011, um, very clearly we were told that they all had to be decompacted, dug out, new base had to go in, new softball had to go down. None of that has happened in 2022. Um, it's clear from Councillor Toomey and from the council officers involved that they don't see any problem here. Um, that there is a fact sheet, I was told today, there's a fact sheet on the state government's website and I should have a look at the fact sheet. Um, I know what the fact sheet says. It says uh, that you shouldn't play on wet, uh, flood contaminated fields, um, sporting fields. Fair enough. I agree completely with that. But what Council doesn't understand is these are not just um, wet, 
flood affected fields. These are, are really um, complex environment where bacteria breed. They are environments that have been uh, impacted by sewerage and council has done nothing to properly remediate them. So I'm just saying now that this is on the public record. I will be advising all residents in my ward. I'll be giving them the Lord Mayor's email. And if he wants to tell all the parents in my ward that it's fine for children to go and play in shit infested playgrounds, that will be his responsibility. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Any further general business? No? Okay. Councillors, we now move on to the adjourned motion, moved by Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor Cook, that Brisbane City Council introduces a new rates category for residential owner occupiers, creating a new class of natural disaster affected uninhabitable homes, and that rates are set at 25% of the amount usually levied under the resolution of rates and charges for a period of up to 12 months. Uh, before we get uh, any further, Councillor Johnston and, and to the Chamber, uh, I've received uh, legal advice just now in regards to the motion. And um, the advice from City Legal is that the urgency motion is not a valid motion. The reason for that being is that a decision cannot be made on the current motion to introduce a new rate category. This is because rates and charges can only be decided by resolution at the budget meeting under section 96 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010. Okay, point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, <coughs> Councillor Johnston. Um, I would like to move an amendment to uh, the current motion, um, and that is that Brisbane City Council considers a new rates category. So delete the word introduces and uh, replace it with the word considers. And I'd need a seconder. 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 Councillor Cumming. Oh. I'll now read out the amendment uh, as presented. So that Brisbane City Council, rather than introduces, it considers a new rates category for residential owner occupiers creating a new class of natural disaster affected uninhabitable homes and that rates are set at 25% of the amount usually levied under the resolution of rates and charges for a period of 12 months. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of uh, order, Deputy Chair. Uh, sorry, point of order, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a question on that. Based on what your previous ruling was, that it can only be considered, debated, voted on during budget, does that change the consideration that we can actually even debate that motion today? We'll just get some advice. Um, the legal advice is that we are able to consider um, um, such a motion, but uh, obviously not introduced. So the motion uh, as amended can proceed. Thank you. P uh, point of order, um, Deputy Chair. Um, I'm, not sure the, I'm not sure the motion is amended. I think we'd have to have an amendment uh, debate on, on a resolution that's been deemed out of order. Um, it's starting to get a little bit it's starting to get a little bit silly when we're doing, an, so we're going to have to have an amendment debate on a resolution that's been deemed out of order to bring it back into order at the, after the conclusion of, of business. Um, can I could I ask that that consideration be given to to moving this to later to a later meeting so that the resolution can be dealt with properly rather than attempting to um, bring it back into compliance um, once it's already been. Moved out of uh, once it's already been deemed out of order. So, if you consider the order of progress, a resolution is proposed, it's deemed out of order. We now have to have an amendment debate on an out of order resolution. Just give me one moment, yeah. Councillor Lawrence. Uh, I'll just move it again. You can see how much they don't want to debate it, right? Can't move it again if business of the day is done. Oh, aren't you people delightful? 
Um, based on Council Wines', Wines question, I just need to adjourn the meeting for five minutes in order to get some further advice. Uh, could I? Mr yeah. Deputy Chair, I move that we adjourn the meeting until you get further advice. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Seconded. Seconded, Council Landers. All in favour of a short adjournment, say aye. aye. Those opposed, say no. Carried. Thank you. Councillors, I've received further advice from City Legal in regards to the amendment that Councillor Johnston has put forward. Um, the advice is that uh, pursuant to section 37.1e, the motion is subject to an existing legal impediment in its drafting and accordingly uh, I have no other option but to rule it out of order. There being no further business? Yes, I've definitely got ge further general business. Councillor uh, Johnston? Thank you. I uh, move suspension uh, sorry, of standing Councilor, orders. You have a point of order, Councillor Johnston? You said, is there any further business? I've definitely got further business. Councillor Johnston. Thank you. Um, I move uh, suspension of standing orders to enable me to move an urgency motion uh, that Brisbane City Council considers a new rates category providing provision for a new class of natural disaster affected uninhabitable homes and that rates are set at 25 per cent of the amount usually levied under the resolution of rates and charges for a period of up to 12 months. And I'll flag I need a seconder. Yeah, I'll second that. Uh, moved by Councillor Johnston. Point of order, Mr Chair. Uh, point of order, Deputy Mayor. Um, under the meeting's local law, the end of general business is the end of the general business of the day. Therefore, I don't believe you can suspend standing orders if there are no standing orders because the meeting has concluded. And you did announce that general business was completed. I did. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. But also, Councillor Johnston, to your point, the body of your motion is still the same as the other and pursuant to the section, section 37.1e, it remains the same. Therefore, it is, I rule it out of order. Uh, that being the case, meeting closed.